Okay, I'm gonna call this meeting to order. The notice requirement provided for the open public meeting law has been satisfied. Noticely was proper, properly given, said notice having been transmitted to the Courier News on Tuesday, January 12th, 2021, as well as posting on the city's website. Clerk, may I have a roll call? Council members Davis. Present. McKenna. Present. McCray. Present. Ms. Ransom. Present. Present. Okay, I got two in the Councilwoman Welch. Present. Vice President Good. Present. Council President Hathaway. Here. We have seven members present in a quorum. Thank you. Uh, clerk, may I have a motion to approve the following visit the minutes that's presented? Council President, can you feedback. repeat that, please? Somebody, there's a lot of feedback there. Somebody may need to mute when they're not speaking. I don't hear it now, though. Uh, I am uh, asking for a motion to approve uh, the minutes of January 19th, 2021. So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposition or abstentions? Okay, the motions, <laughs> the minutes have been approved. All right, uh, we're gonna start this evening with uh, discussion items. Uh, we have a presentation for you. Uh, Advanced Digital Manufacturing Pro Project is here and is gonna step us through uh, some of the th exciting things that they've been doing. So welcome, and you have the floor. Okay, uh, we have Mike Vandersloos with us from uh, New Jersey Innovation Institute, and we have Dr. Victoria Ukachuku with us, uh, the Dean of the Union County Plainfield uh, Campus, and we'll talk about the Advanced Digital Manufacturing Project. So Mike, you're on. Uh, thank you. and. I will share my screen with the room here. All right, can you guys see the presentation? Now we can, yes. All right, let me go full screen. So um, uh, thank you, Director Jackson, and thank you to the entire city council for allowing me a few minutes this evening um, as, uh, Director Jackson had mentioned, we are, are coming off of a phase two of what's been a very exciting project in the West End Industrial Corridor, and we are moving into a phase three. So tonight we are formally requesting that the NJII contract between uh, with the city of Plainfield be extended for a nine month period um, at a value of $75,000 to continue um, our work with Valerie and her team on the economic development group that will effectively cover our time um, with Valerie for uh, the remainder of 2021 with some contracting work on the front end and reporting on the back end. So I want to talk primarily about the progress in phase two, but I think enough time has passed where it's good to reflect on where we landed on phase one to provide some of that context. So phase one, as you will recall, was funded by a seed grant by New Jersey EDA. It was launched in uh, October of 2019. And really there was three core elements or outcomes of that phase one. And the first was to envision what was possible for the West End Industrial Corridor. And we did that primarily through community engagement. So engaging the business community, the academic community and other stakeholders, combining that with a uh, economic analysis and market analysis to reveal that Plainfield is very well positioned to double down on its industrial heritage, but more importantly, to reinvest in the future of manufacturing, which like everything else in our lives is a very digital future. Um, one of the concrete deliverables of phase one was also the infrastructure for advanced manufacturing, which is a high speed communication 
5G network that we designed for Valerie and provided her a cost and a timeline and ultimately will be provided to a developer to deploy that network in the 60 acre corridor. But really what I think makes this a unique project, unique from a traditional uh, real estate redevelopment project is the manufacturing innovation programming that we are designing for the corridor. So we are complementing the traditional redevelopment project with a set of programs that really drive the outcomes that Valerie set out for us, which are our traditional economic development outcomes, expanding businesses, attracting new businesses, new mid and high skill careers. Uh, and the programs really allow us to focus how we achieve those goals and to make sure they're as inclusive as possible. So really where NJI is contributing is the design of these technology amenities. I talked about the 5G network we've designed, but also these innovation programmings to really support inclusive growth. So let me talk about where we've been spending most of our time in phase two. So um, holistically, we, re we refer to this as the New Jersey Manufacturing Center for Digital Transformation. It has three core elements, two of them programmatic. Uh, the primary programmatic element is to work with New Jersey manufacturers, um, small and medium sized manufacturers to help them adopt new digital production technologies. These are manufacturers like Injectron right here in Plainfield. So it really allows us to work with existing businesses and help them grow and be more competitive. So I, I make the point because it's um, the issue of displacement was brought up quite early in our business engagement. This isn't just about attracting businesses. It's working with existing businesses and helping them grow and expand. These new digital technologies have to be operated by human beings. And so there needs to be a talent component. So Dr. Ukuchukwu from UCC has been involved early on in the visioning of this project and has really remained committed throughout this effort. She's the lead or UCC's the lead academic partner here to develop digital manufacturing curriculum for um, both incumbent workers, so workers that are already based here in Plainfield and North Jersey, um, but also creating kind of this next generation of manufacturing digital natives. So um, we've worked to pull together this high level design and then um, this, there will be a physical element of this as well. So uh, Valerie has helped us identify what we've referred to as an anchor property, but this is the former South Second Street Youth Center. And this will be the home for these programmatic elements, but also um, a learning factory. So actually expanding um, ideally the UCC campus into this space with um, manufacturing equipment that can be used for educational purposes, but also demonstrate these new digital manufacturing technologies, again, to get these small businesses over the hump of what's the return on our investment? How do they see and touch and feel these technologies to say, yes, I want this, yes, I need this, and we can help them onboard that tech. So um, we're working with, I believe this is the, the redevelopment plan has already been accepted. If not, it's certainly pending, but we're working with a developer um, who's uh, pushing us to get this, uh, his group um, quite a bit of detail on how we wanna build out this space. So that was a primary element of the phase two work. Um, and this I think is probably the most exciting piece of it. We've spent the last six to seven months building an advisory network and a partner network. So um, leveraging um, our connections at NJIT and NJII, we've been engaged with Fortune 500 manufacturing companies, um, a global consulting firm, Deloitte, that is an expert in digital transformation in the manufacturing space. We have startup companies. We have the federal government advising us on this project to make sure we're aligning with market trends um, as well as where the government is going to be investing in the next four years under the Biden administration. So we have a, a, a very prestigious advisory group here, but really within our circle here, um, we've, or we're developing a, a, just need to put pen to paper on a new MOU um, with UCC, NJI and the city. But we've added a fourth partner here, which is really exciting, the New Jersey Manufacturing Extension Program. 
the reason they're exciting for folks that aren't familiar is they represent um, upwards of 11,000 manufacturing companies in New Jersey. That's going to give us the insight we need to design the program. And it's going to give us the network we need to actually engage with these folks um, so they can tell us what they need. We can design into the program and then create a pipeline of, of users um, when this is, is actually executed. Um, so I want to so putting phase three into context, what 2021 looks like. So the first phase was really community engagement, making sure this is aligned with what um, community stakeholders and played fields want and need. Phase two was hardening up the design and really building the players, the network we need to execute. And phase three is developing these implementation plans, really getting to a detailed business prospectus where we can say this will be the cost for investors. Um, and this is how we're going to actually um, execute and make the plan happen. So it's an exciting year. Uh, we have all the players stacked up to get this done. And by end of this year, um, we hope to be sending out proposals to actually get some real funding behind um, executing this. So, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Valerie, who I think will tee up Dr. Ugachuko. Stop sharing my screen. Valerie, you're on mute. <laughs> All right. Doctor, you have a few comments you want to add? Uh, you're on mute. So good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you, Director Jackson, for uh, inviting me to um, say a few words here. Um, Union County College is very excited, is very pleased to be a partner in this project. And as Mike uh, just um, presented, this is actually, uh, this is an exciting partnership, uh, what, I, what I consider to be on the leading edge. And Union County College through its Plainfield campus uh, looks to uh, provide, bring its acad extensive academic um, strength, resources, and uh, its, its capacity to offer innovative curriculum to support this initiative. So we're, we're very excited and we look forward to extending the reach of the, of the college to help support the uh, goals of the, of the uh, city of Plainfield and the local community. So I'm here to say that we are fully engaged and uh, look forward to being a productive partner in this well, effort. Well, thank you. I'll turn it back over to council president to see if he has any questions or comments. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, a nice presentation. Um, uh, there was some nice renderings there. Was that a, uh, an actual rendering of, uh, of what the, the, the overhaul of that building could look like? Uh, uh, yes, it is. And it was provided by uh, Wilder Architecture, uh, who has done projects here uh, in the city, the South 2nd Street Youth Center, uh, the station at Grant. And so, uh, yes, they did do the rendering and it looks very nice. <laughs> nice. Um, what are the main obstacles here, or, or not, not obstacles, but you know, obviously uh, our industrial uh, corridor is, is vastly underused. So are there any specific strategies in order to, to really get that, that, uh, that working, given that, you know, it's not that, that it's abandoned, but occupied and underused by uh, our business owners? So the, uh, well, Valerie, you want, want me to go or you want to take it? You can go. <laughs> um, I, I think we, my strategy or our strategy this entire time was to get aligned with state and federal actors. So um, I'm not sure that folks that, that um, the NJMEP, so in fact, every state has one of these manufacturing extension programs and they are connected to a Washington DC strategy body on how to how to best support especially small and medium-sized manufacturing companies. Um, we need to uh, connect to that network via our local MEP, which is then gonna elevate us closer to the state strategy and then as well to a federal strategy. 
if, if we don't have that, I would worry about our success. And so um, Valerie and Victoria and I um, recently established this partnership with MEP, which makes me really excited about kind of greasing the wheels of making sure that this is successful. So, so that, I mean, that's not fully formed. So that's gonna be critical to success. And two is, and this is my, after this, I'll let uh, Valerie respond, but two, um, we can't create a program that industry is not going to use. So again, that's why this MEP is critically important. We need to engage with these 11,000 manufacturing companies and say, what can we build um, that will entice you to actually engage with this, to create this kind of state level center of gravity. So if we can do that and have a compelling program um, that industry wants to use and um, it is state and federally supported, I think that's gonna create a center of gravity to attract people to, uh, to the corridor. And then when you combine that with you know, a beautiful redevelopment project, I think that really positions Plainfield well to um, reignite that, that whole area. That's, that's my two cents, Valerie. Uh, yes, I would also say that at the same time that we're doing this work uh, to connect uh, with the industry, we're also doing a study, an area in need of redevelopment study and hope to come away with a redevelopment plan. So we're studying every property in the quarter to find out exactly what is occurring in that particular property. So we'll be bringing that back to you asking you to designate the areas in need of redevelopment. But as we stay connected to local manufacturers uh, that have been here for the past five or six decades, uh, they're interested in investment. Uh, they are interested in resources. They know they have to retool and re-equip to be ready to take the future on. So Injectron is a good one. Uh, there are plastic uh, manufacturing molds plastic mold manufacturing company, uh, but the equipment that they have today doesn't allow them to turn around and manufacture PPE equipment, for example. And so we want to help them position them uh, to grow and expand their businesses, as well as bring in new uh, industrial businesses into the corridor. We have questions from council members or comments. No. I, I, Councilman McKenna. Yeah. Um, first one, just because it it was just mentioned, um, Director Jackson, you you mentioned that we're studying those properties, and that at some point you may come to the council for designation of those areas for need of in need of development. But did we pass a resolution asking you to study those? And when did we do that? Just remind me, because we've done a lot of them. I know. We did the exact date, I don't remember, but I will get that information to you. Currently on my team, uh, uh, Brittany Claybrook and Bill Neerstead are working on the area in need of study. Uh, so they've been hard at work, work at that. We have about, I don't know, 28 to 30 properties that we're looking at. Uh, but yes, you did direct us to do an area in need of study, uh, which is the process of course, as you are aware. So you did, but I'll have to get the date. It was sometime last year. Okay, thank you. Um, and then my other question, kind of a little bit more, more broad is, what, what examples can, can be pointed to, um, and this is probably for Mr. Vandersloos, is, is uh, what examples of, of successful projects like this are, are you, um, using or modeling that, that would be similar to Plainfield? Obviously not 100% because there's variables in different communities and et cetera, but, but what, what sorts of things are you, are you looking at that, that would be similar to what we want to achieve here? Uh, that's a great question, Sean. And I, I recently, and, and Va Valerie, maybe we should send this around to the group. Um, Deloitte, which I, I, before you say Deloitte's not quite Plainfield, so Deloitte is a multi, maybe billion dollar consulting, global consulting firm. And uh, they have built a, um, a smart factory in partnership with a um, Wichita state. And, and it is 
very much what we are modeling, what we're doing in Plainfield after. And the reason why this is, is a good example is it shows that even, so clients from a Deloitte is gonna be a Fortune 500 company. And Deloitte has recognized the need for these demonstration centers to show manufacturing companies um, the use cases to help them create the ROI to make these new investments. So even the biggest companies need this. But the problem with that is that Deloitte is serving maybe the top five you know, percent of the supply chain. So the way we've been pitching this to the state is saying we can't let the tip of the supply chain, the top tier of the supply chain run away from the small and medium sized businesses. So how do we take clearly a very luxury model of a smart factory and, and uh, reshape it for a small and medium sized set of manufacturers from a cost perspective, from a from a the needs of an injectron are not the same things as the needs of a, a caterpillar of a Boeing of a, a large manufacturing companies like that. So um, I want to take the Deloitte Wichita model and redesign it, lean it up for the UCC playing field model. So that's, I think, a very clean example of exactly what we want to try. Not exactly, but really what we would like to do, um, but, you know, reposition for a playing field market. Okay, and and where 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 are the the bigger differences between that Wichita model and and Plainfield? Like wh where is where is our challenge going to come in? So uh, I think pro probably the biggest challenge is that we can't we can't do the the breadth. I wouldn't say the depth. So if you look at a digital manufacturing facility and what they're building in Wichita, I mean it is soup to nuts. Um, every aspect of manufacturing from distribution, um, warehousing to the actual production equipment, they have digital applications ev everywhere. I would say maybe uh, dozens of them. And they have the breadth to be able to do that. I think we can really only focus on um, one to three, you know, applications in the smart manufacturing arena. And so, the challenge is going to be selecting those one to three that are going to capture as many manufacturing companies as possible in, in North Jersey, which is really primarily where manufacturing is located, as you all know, in the state, with Plainfield really being perfectly centrally located in that. So the challenge is, you know, Deloitte can do 50, we can probably do three, and it's picking the right three to still be impactful. And, and the biggest issue I'm guessing that limits it to three is the distribution side of that. Um, I, well, I, I think it's just staffing. I, so, I mean, it's really kind of resources. I would imagine this factory, this Deloitte factory employs, you know, dozens and dozens of people. I mean, this, this business plan that we're gonna be creating in phase three, it's gonna need, need a staffing plan. It's gonna need an equipment budget. And um, Deloitte is able to throw a lot, a lot of money at this. And I just don't think we're going to be able to do that given, you know, the funding sources that um, kind of a state and municipal body would have available to us. Um, to be one of the interesting parts of the conversation with Deloitte was that their factory is, is a loss leader. Okay, so they, they basically use it as part of the sales cycle to demonstrate um, the use of these technologies, and then they will follow on with a, you know, multi-million dollar contract with one of these clients that says, yes, I want one of these technologies. So they're able to invest a lot more than, than we're able to invest in. So um, I, I think it's really just what resources are available to us versus what Deloitte would have available to them. Okay. Thank you very much. That's, sure. I'll, I'll look into that stuff. Thank you. Yeah. And Valerie, let's, let's send around that example to everybody because it's really clean it's really nice and i i think it it lends a lot of credibility to the fact that this is a market driven need that we are doing this based on where the market is going as well as a need in playing field that provides that real nice nice intersection thank you will do okay mm -hmm. council president thank you mike thank you Sure. Thank you all for your time once again, and it's good to see everybody. Thank you for your time. Thank you all.
I appreciate it. Uh, we'll now move to consideration of public hearing, second reading and final passage. Uh, clerk, please read MC 2021 by title and further certify that is complied with all statutory publication requirements. MC 2021 is an ordinance granting title 39 jurisdiction to the city of Plainfield over roads and parking lots located property known as 662 through 758 South 2nd Street shown on the Plainfield city tax map block 112 lot 901. It's hereby certified that the notice of the public hearing on this ordinance was published in Courier News on January 26, 2021. Floor is now open to any member of the public who wishes to speak on this ordinance. Many who tune in uh, every month is aware of the process where you are to hit the hand icon to indicate that uh, you would like to speak. You'll be unmuted, state your name and address for the record, uh, and you'll be given three minutes. Also, if you dialed in using a landline, it is star nine to use the hand raise function. Okay, Mr. Priano, please uh, unmute yourself. Name and address for the record, please. Uh, Timothy Priano, Martin Avenue, but I'm a little confused. Are we going through line by line or is this open? We're going, we're going just this ordinance. So if you want to speak up uh, generally about something other than this ordinance, then there will be an opportunity later in the meeting for that. Okay, because that was not on the agenda. So I got confused when we were doing open. Okay, it, it will be uh, towards the end where we'll do uh, open public comment. So we have public comments for the resolutions right now? Yes, this specifically uh, MC 2021-21. Uh, um, Okay, so I can come back on for another one. You may. Thank you. And just to clarify, uh, on page three, right on the very top, it says public comments limited to resolutions, bonuses, uh, motions and ordinances. And at the end of the agenda, it indicates that there's a general public comment. So this is public comments solely on the public hearing on the ordinances, just to clarify. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Is there any, any other member of the public who wishes to speak on this ordinance? Hearing and seeing none, may I have a motion to close public hearing on this ordinance? So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion to adopt this ordinance on second reading and final passage. Uh, and if adopted, this ordinance shall be published as required by law. Move, Council President. Second. Second. Clerk, may I have a roll call? Moved by Council Vice President Good, seconded by Councilwoman Davis. Council Members Davis. Yes. McKenna. Yes. McCray. Yes. Ms. Ransom. Yes. Welch. <clears throat> Welch. Yes. Vice President Good. Yes. Council President. Yes. That is unanimous. So it's been adopted on second reading and final passage. Thank you, Clerk. Um, also, please read MC 2021 <clears throat> 02. Uh, by title and further certify that it is this ordinance has complied with all statutory publication requirements. MC 202102 is an ordinance granting title 39 jurisdiction to the city of Plainfield over roads and parking lots 1314 through 1326 South Avenue is hereby certified that the notice of the public hearing on this ordinance was published in the Courier News on January 26, 2021. Or is now open for any member of the public who would like to speak on this ordinance. Hearing and seeing no hands raised, I'll entertain a motion to close public hearing on this ordinance. Move. So move. Second. Okay, may I have a motion to adopt this ordinance on second reading and final passage? And if adopted, the ordinance shall be published as required by law. <coughs> Moved. Second. Second. Clerk, may I have a roll call? Moved by Vice President Good, seconded by Councilman McCray. Council Members Davis? Yes. Okay. Yes. McCray? Yes. Ms. Ransom? Yes. 
Yes. Vice President Good. Yes. <laughs> Council President Hockaday. Yes. That's unanimous. Ordinance has been adopted on second reading and final passage. Thank you, clerk. Please read MC 2021 03 by title and further certify that the ordinance has complied with all statutory publication requirements. MC 2021 03 is an ordinance of the city of Plainfield and the county of the union adopting the TODD South Redevelopment Plan Amendment dated November 5th, 2020, is hereby certified. The notice of this public hearing on this ordinance was published in the Courier News on January 26, 2021. The floor is now open to any member of the public who would like to speak on this ordinance. Again, reminded to hit the hand icon uh, if you wish to speak, if you're on the phone, the star something. Star nine. I always forget, star nine. No problem. <laughs> Hearing and seeing no members of the public who wish to speak, I uh, may I have a motion to close public hearing on this ordinance. Second. Second. Okay. I have a motion to adopt this ordinance on second reading and final passage. So and moved. Second. Clerk, roll call, please. Councilman McCray, seconded by Vice President Good. Council members Davis? Yes. McKenna? Yes. McCray? Yes. Ransom? Yes. Milch? Yes. Vice President Good? Yes. Council President Hockaday? Yes. Unanimous. This ordinance has been adopted. Second reading. Clerk, please read MC 2021 04 and certify that the ordinance has complied with all statutory publication requirements. MC 2021-04 is an ordinance to amend chapter 16, article 19, section 8B, fees and fines with updated rates. Hereby certify that the notice of the public hearing on this ordinance was published in the Courier News on January 26, 2020. Door is now open for any member of the public who wishes to speak on this ordinance. Hearing and seeing no hands raised. I have a motion to close public hearing on this ordinance. Moved. Second. I have a motion to adopt this ordinance on second reading and final passage. Moved. Second. Clerk, roll call, please. Moved by Vice President Good, seconded by Councilwoman Davis. Council members Davis. Yes. McKenna. Yes. McCray. Yes. Ms. Ransom. Yes. Welch. Yes. Was President Good. Yes. Was President Hockaday. Yes. That is unanimous. This ordinance has been adopted on second reading and final passage. Thank you. The ordinance shall be published as required by law. Okay, we now uh, move to public comments, limited to resolutions, motions, and ordinances to be introduced on first reading. A uh, total of 30 minutes has been allocated for uh, the same. Uh, if you wish to be heard, hit the hand icon to be recognized and you'll be unmuted. Give your name and address for the record. Uh, each speaker will be given three minutes. The floor is now open. I see Mrs. Berwinkle, uh, name and address for the record. Welcome. Hi, thanks. Mary Berwinkle, 1785 Sleepy Hollow Lane. Um, I'd like to make a comment at R107-21 designating 234 East 9th Street as a non-condemnation rede redevelopment area. I'm aware that this is one of the 197 scattered sites, but I am concerned about this area, which is in or near the historic district. I fear that the city will approve another dense, unattractive multifamily structure with insufficient parking and no green space, just because that is what developers wanna build. I hope that the snow this winter on top of the pandemic is reminding the approvers that people need places to put their vehicles and get outside. Our master plan gives at least lip service to maintaining character and density in established neighborhoods. Please keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. 
Do you see any other members of the public? Ms. Mingo Horton. Please, yes. Uh, uh, good evening, Nicole Mingo Horton, 1366 St. Nicholas Boulevard. Uh, I would like to speak about MC 202106. Um, I see that this is an ordinance that's proposing to remove the four way stop at Rock Avenue and at Myrtle Avenue. Um, I'm not sure what the rationale is behind that. I know that that's a very busy intersection and traffic can get backed up. Uh, but there is definitely a need for some type of traffic control there. And I do not see uh, where it's indicated anywhere that that will be placed with, be replaced with a stoplight. Um, but I am concerned that you're proposing to remove it from that location. And I don't see anything um, to replace it, to continue to improve the traffic in that area. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your question. And when we get to that resolution, uh, we'll have the police director uh, chime in uh, on the rationale behind that. Uh, now see uh, Ms. Pivovar. Yes, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Nancy Pivovar, 1129 Myrtle Avenue. Uh, I just want to, uh, I appreciate that the Economic Development Office has placed R10321 on the agenda, and I support this resolution regarding the placement of the Crossroads Interpretive Signage at the Drake House Museum. In 2001, the City Council, your past people on the City Council passed the resolution R38501, which supported the designation of the Crossroads of the American Revolution National Heritage Area in Central Jersey. It was in 2006 that Congress finally established the Heritage Area, which is managed by the dedicated nonprofit and works in partnership with the National Park Service. And the main National Park Service partner is Morristown National Historic Park. The Historical Society of Plainfield Drake House Museum has been a local partner, member of the Crossroads for the American Revolution Heritage Area for many years. Crossroads is very generous to the Drake House uh, with sending materials that they create for school children which the society distributes to the children who visit. They supply maps, pins, pens, flags, and activity booklets. And the society does pay a nominal partnership membership fee every year, but the uh, supplies that we receive are at no additional cost. And due to the affiliation with the heritage area, the County of Union was able to obtain national parks, passport stamps for the Drake House. This affiliation has brought visitors from other states. If anyone in Plainfield has a National Parks Passport book, remember you can get it stamped at the Drake House or at a few other Revolutionary War sites in Union County. As most of you know, I've been working with a group of men who are local historians and we are searching for the location of the lost fort of the Plainfield. The pandemic has put some of the physical aspects of the search on hold, but we have found many online primary source documentations of this fort. In discussion with a Vermeule and Drake descendant who lives in Texas, he mentioned the interpretive signs offered by um, Crossroads while I was at a Crossroads workshop at Morven. So I asked about the policy uh, possibility of getting a sign and the rest as they say is history. This sign will be an added benefit to the city of Plainville and help tell the story of Plainville's role in the revolution. Caesar's significant role will be highlighted Caesar was a teamster and served as a free African-American. His military record shows that he traveled as far away as Trenton. Crossroads and the Historical Society are preparing for the 250th anniversary of the revolution, which will take place in 2026. Crossroads will work with the society and in turn, the society will work with the city, the Historic Preservation Commission for proper wording and images to be placed on the sign. An exact list Location still is not being determined, in um, but will be determined in consultation with all parties in the city. This interpretive panel will help to tell Plainfield's early history and Caesar's significant role, and Crossroads will cover the cost. I appreciate and advance your support of the installation of the Crossroads branded signage at the Drake House Museum. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for all your work with that, preserving um, a bit of Plainfield's history. Mr. Priano. Uh, yes, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Hockaday. Sorry, AJ, couldn't read right tonight. I have a couple of points to make. 
Um, the statement address for the record, I'm sorry. Oh, 1405 Martin. Thanks. A few points to make this evening. Today is February 16th. We're halfway through the month. We need, since we only are allowed to have one meeting a month, since we still haven't heard why we're only having one meeting a month, but we are, we have on the agenda, Black History Month. We're at the end of the month, in the middle of the month. How are we getting this information out? These things have to be told to the community earlier. Next month is um, March and that's Women's Month. We need to get this information out to the public to remind them, not halfway through the period of the process. I'm also like to address, and that was, I'm sorry, I didn't call the numbers out on it. It was R08621 for um, Black History Month, R08721 for American Heart Month. These are things that we have to put ahead of the game. I mean, people need to be aware of this halfway through the month, next month, March, we'll be in the middle of March and we're not gonna address the strong women that run, that are part of our community. Um, I also have a problem with R09121. I understand we can recognize Ms. Tyson, but we have some very powerful women, men in this community of African-American descent who are champions of civil rights, who have done things for our city, and we need to make sure we're honoring these people in our community so that everyone knows we have famous people here, people who are growing every day with their um, position. I know that we've been trying to get um, the Bookers to a school named after them, but the more recognition we give to Mr. and Mrs. Booker, the more we'll get the new school named after them. These are so many things that we can help to build Plainfield's image than putting recognition for an actress that has no roots in Plainfield. And we have amazing people here in Plainfield we should be honoring every single month. And my last point is 092-21, authorizing $60,000 for a political action group. Uh, their local office, I see we have big times from uh, South Carolina here, but their local office is in Westfield. They have given more money to the Republicans and trying to suppress voting and to Kelly Lefter, this, this company Mercury is supposedly unbought, uh, supposed to be nonpartisan. But if you look at the local New Jersey money they fun, funnel through is to the Republican party. Last I checked, we're a democratic city unless the mayor's announcing he's switching parties this year. But we really need to focus on making sure we have our strength in local politics not national or state. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Mingo Horton was, uh, was spoke already. I see her activated, but is there anyone else? Uh, no, there was a person that raised their hand, but they just put it down again. Okay. All right, uh, I'll entertain a motion to close public comments. Moved. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition or abstentions? Okay, public comment is now uh, closed. Um, let's see. We'll now move to resolutions. Uh, are there any comments on council resolutions R8621 through R89-21? Take those as a block. We can ask questions on any of those. Hearing and seeing none. Um, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. <clears throat> Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition or abstentions? Those resolutions are approved. Clerk, would you please uh, proceed with the reading of the resolutions? Yes, resolution 9021 is a resolution urging Governor Phil Murphy to sign A21 and A89-21 
1897, in implementing the legalization of cannabis and removing the criminal penalties. Do we have any questions from council members? Comments? Yes. Councilwoman Davis, please. Um, so I'm not gonna pretend like I'm super familiar with everything, single thing that's in these, uh, in these bills, um, but in these bills, is there anything pointing to a social justice component um, to help rectify uh, the disparities that happen to people who are arrested for prior marijuana convictions? That's our council can, uh, can chime in on that. I could speak to that. Um, yeah, Abby, go ahead. Okay, so what we're asking for basically is, Governor Murphy had originally stated that when um, marijuana became legal in New Jersey, that there would be expungements for people who had prior criminal, who had been arrested or you know, received criminal penalties for use of marijuana or possession of marijuana uh, you know, prior to the legalization. But now what seems to be happening uh, at the state level is the governor is refusing to sign the bill that would remove the criminal penalties. Uh, and instead he's leveraging that, his signature on that with a demand to include civil and criminal penalties on minors. So anybody under the age of 21 who possess marijuana even after the legalization. And so what, we, what the mayor feels, what we feel as an administration is that the removal of the criminal penalties is essential in terms of the legalization of marijuana because obviously there was a disproportionate amount of black and brown individuals being arrested for possession and for use. And we wanna see those criminal penalties removed from their records. Secondly, we don't wanna see um, criminal and civil penalties on minors under the age of 21 for use and possession of marijuana uh, moving forward, even, even when it's legal, because we know based on what happened, you know, what's been happening for the past multiple decades, that that will also disproportionately impact black and brown youth. And so uh, this resolution is urging the governor to stop leveraging one for the other and um, you know, agree to what he originally agreed to, which was the legalization and the removal of the criminal penalties and stop leveraging that with his um, demand to include civil, civil and criminal penalties on minors. So it, it, it is a social justice issue and that's what we're advocating for. Just a quick question, Council President. Sure. Um, so my understanding is that the expungement is not a topic um, in this. It is merely the, the uh, underage, under 21 um, penalties, which are misdemeanor, not, not criminal, um, which is what was in the fix, the fix, the, the legislation that was passed uh, to fix the two bills. Um, and you know, I, I think if this body is going to move forward with this without having deep understanding of this, this legislation and, and what's going on here, we're, we're kind of having a conversation about how we're not going to penalize anybody under 21, um, even in, in, as a misdemeanor, um, for possession of less than an ounce. Um, we're, we're, we're also kind of advocating that um, possession of alcohol should probably not have a a penalty and possession of cigarettes should not have a penalty and possession of vapes should not have a penalty and anything else that is restricted by age. So I am not comfortable um, because I don't think it's our uh, purview here um, on, on this short a notice for us to go through these bills um, as we should do if we're going to really uh, pass judgment on this and promote somebody signing this legislation. I, I'm not comfortable doing it on, on either side of it. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's our, our role, so. Any other questions from council members or comments regarding this? So I wanna thank BA Levison for her um, explanation. Um, it, okay, it makes sense. Um, but to Councilman McKenna's point, I think we have to be careful about allowing misdemeanors for youth, um, for underage possession, because what it then leads to is that same cycle 
that we see now with the war on drugs. And we know that when it comes to criminalization of things that communities like Plainfield are generally uh, over criminalized and over policed and our people are the people who are mostly affected as opposed to another suburban town in New Jersey. So I think that we need to be advocating for things that make sense for all the residents. Um, and we know that youth misdemeanors while they may be misdemeanors, when you don't understand the justice system, when you don't have money to get a good attorney, they then turn into bigger problems and ultimately they turn into criminal records for our children that we don't need. Yes. Councilwoman Davis, I don't, I don't disagree with you at, at all on that. Um, and, and my comment was not meant to imply that, that we should be out creating um, any sort of, of rules that, that uh, come down heavily on any particular population. However, I think that my, my point, and, and this is what I want to reiterate, is that none of, the, none of the voting members on this panel know the ins and outs of this legislation. Um, so for us to be promoting that the, the mayor or the, the governor sign this legislation um, is, is just, we shouldn't be doing this. So, and, and I, I will admit that I have only skimmed through the legislation previously. So I, I don't know all the ins and outs of it. And, and I'm not willing to put my name out there and say he should sign it. And any, any other council person want to chime in? You know, I, I, I'll just say, um, you know, I haven't looked at the entire uh, bill as well, but uh, one one thing I do know is that the the, the war on drugs has been um, it it has been devastating to our, our communities, uh, and it, it, it's it's somewhat it's 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 mostly disrespectful uh, and a and a slap in the face. Uh, for there to be a legalization of, of, of cannabis when there's so many uh, black and brown individuals who are incarcerated for the same thing. Um, so I'm for any, any proposal that reduces the criminal penalties because, you know, for me, this is, this is just about how much of a failure the war on drugs was and continues to be and it seems as though there's some legislators that want to continue the war uh, by legalizing it, making it monetary feasible for some uh, to engage in, in the trade and usage of it, uh, but still leaving in place some of uh, you know any criminal penalties. I mean that's it's, that's it's so disrespectful and so ignorant of, of, uh, of how, how devastating the, the war on drugs has been to our communities that, you know, that I, I would certainly support removing criminal penalties from any, uh, any, any proposed legislation uh, for legalization. You know, we know it's, that legalization is, is going to happen. It was just passed by referendum uh, by the state by overwhelming uh, majority uh, in our last election. So it is coming whether we like it or not. Uh, but in terms of these criminal penalties, we cannot have it, you know. Uh, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll move on uh, from there. Uh, do we have a motion? So be it. Second. Sure. Okay. Uh, clerk, can I have a roll call? Council members, Davis? <clears throat> yes. McKenna? No. McCray? Yes. Mills Ransom? Yes. Welsh? You're on mute, Councilwoman Welch. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Vice President Good? Yes. Council President Hyde? Yeah. Yes. Six in favor, one opposed, resolution passes. Come to resolution okay. 9121. Uh, recognizing Cicely Tyson, legendary actress, civil rights champion. Any questions from council members? Hearing and seeing none, do we have a motion and a second? Yes. So move. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition or abstentions? This resolution is approved. Resolution 9221 authorizing the execution of an agreement with. Mercury Public Affairs LLC in the city of Plainfield. Questions from council members? 
Yes. Who was that? Me, Ashley. Councilwoman Davis. Um, can we just have, I guess, more explanation about the scope of work that would come um, with entering into this agreement? This is Abby, I could speak to that. So I'll talk a little bit about, um, and, and just so everybody knows, we have Clay Middleton uh, from Mercury on the call who can answer specific questions if, if we get there. Um, but what basically what's happening is a lot is happening in Washington right now, especially with the change of administration. And we feel, we believe that this new administration might be more receptive, will likely be more receptive to giving funding to urban municipalities like Plainfield. Um, and so we want to have a spot at the table when those funding opportunities become available. And, and we need to be in the know about that. Uh, th some of this is about CARES, CARES Act legislation and, ensuring that um, somebody is in Washington advocating for us that the CARES Act needs to have funding at the most local level, the municipal level, not even the county level. But also um, we do believe that this new administration will be more open to, to uh, passing federal, le federal level legislation that will specifically have a positive impact on urban municipalities and so we want to we want to be part of that. We want to make sure we're not missing out on uh, funding opportunities, legislative opportunities that could benefit our residents. And so since we obviously are unable to do that by ourselves, we need to have a firm who is uniquely situated to help us as Plainfield because we need someone who's a, aware of the challenges that an urban municipality faces and B has boots on the ground in DC. And so we thought that Mercury would be, is that firm because they have offices in Newark. Um, they're very familiar with urban municipalities and the, the specialized challenges that we face and they have offices in DC. So they're very familiar with advocating for municipalities like us, our specific challenges. Um, and what they'll be doing is they'll be meeting with, with um, both the director of DPW, director of economic development, director of health, of health and social services, myself, finding out what our priorities are in terms of funding and in terms of goals, what things we want to have for our residents. And they'll be advocating for those types of changes in Washington, those types of funding opportunities in Washington on our behalf. I could give you some examples if you, if you want. Um, like, so for example, the flood maps and FEMA flood maps is something we have no control over, uh, but it affects our residents greatly. And it's, it's a big problem for a lot of our residents. So that's something we will be asking them to advocate for on our behalf. Um, there are, you know, road resurfacing projects that we're going to be looking at. Again, right now, COVID is obviously at the forefront of everybody's mind. So CARES Act legislation is going to be huge for us in terms of um, what, we're, what we're talking to them about for right now. But there, you know, there's a lot of projects that we need Washington's help with. I mean, we can only get so far with the county and the state and really, especially, we really want to capitalize on the new administration, their energy, their willingness to help. Um, and, and we feel this is the best way to do that. Thank so you. I appreciate, if I may, I appreciate uh, your explanation but my concern is we belong to the legal municipalities. We belong to the Urban Mayors Association. We belong to the Mayor's Conference, I think it's called. We belong to all of these other organizations that should be helping to advocate, the urban mayors being one, for example, right? They are a group of mayors that represent multiple municipalities who have the pulse of what's going on in urban communities across the state. Why are we not using, why are we not leveraging that group to then uh, appeal to Washington on our behalf. The president of the Urban Mayors is currently the mayor of the largest city in New Jersey. 
So I'm pretty sure he has some, you know, he has some pull. Why are we, we already pay membership dues into all of those different uh, organizing bodies. Why are we not using the various organizing bodies that we already pay dues into to continue to advocate on our behalf as opposed to bringing a brand new company uh, to also do the same thing that we want? So what I would say to that is uh, it's it's twofold. We are utilizing all of those memberships, um, but again, we're lumped in with many other municipalities in all of those in all of those memberships. There's nobody who in those memberships. Well, I mean, obviously we have our mayor who's in there for us, but there's no lobbying. Um, directly for Plainfield, we're kind of one of many in all of those groups. And what Mercury can do is take Plainfield, just us, you know, solely focused, our legislative priorities, our legislative needs, and advocate directly in Washington. There's no middleman, there's no, you know, 45 other municipalities and what they think. It's it's a it's a direct line of communication from us to DC. Okay. So I just want to push back on that a little bit. We do have um, there would be a middleman. Mercury would now be the middleman, um, especially when we have such great relationships with our Congress people already, right? Um, our Congresswoman, she, she comes to Plainfield multiple times of the year. Uh, you know, pre-COVID, we have. Uh, our two senators who come to Plainfield pretty regularly, who are in constant communication with Plainfield. Um, are there any other municipalities who utilizes uh, Mercury services and what is their size in comparison to Plainfield? I could, I could let, I could let Clay um, speak to that in terms of his other clients, because I, I don't feel um, particularly well-versed in, in their other clients. Um, so, so Clay, I'm gonna hand it over to you to speak on that matter. Sure, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to do so. Um, LeVar Young and Mo Butler were unable to, to be uh, here tonight. Uh, so I, I'm here, uh, and, and just to address some of what you were, were stating, uh, I've worked uh, at a municipality uh, the city of Charleston, South Carolina, uh, and very close with the majority whip, Jim Clyburn, and have been for, since I was in high school, and I used to work for him. Um, I would tell you that, yes, you have great relationships with your congressional delegation, uh, and there's things that the congressional delegation is going to do, uh, but as it relates to specific agencies, uh, whether it be HUD, whether it be DOJ, whether it be at whatever the agency is, uh, there are specific um, items that your municipality would want the attention of. Uh, having interacted with the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, and the African American Mayor Association, of whom former presidents of both of those groups, uh, Steve Benjamin, um, is, is not only a friend, but a family member of mine. Uh, so I certainly understand why these memberships are important and the work uh, that they do. So when you look at Birmingham, Alabama, uh, as an example, uh, they are a, a client of Mercury. Um, there are other cities in New Jersey uh, that LeVar and Mo Butler service previously uh, and, and currently. Um, some of those projects are I'm not gonna say the same as yours, but there's specific items that they take uh, not only to your congressional delegation from a different angle, uh, but also especially the appropriation angle, uh, which is always ongoing. Uh, but the administration, especially this one, based on the relationships with various, um, uh, various offices within agencies. Again, it's not just about who's the cabinet secretary, but who is the undersecretary or the assistant secretary uh, that's really making some of the decisions that affect you? Looking for additional questions? Oh, uh, Councilman McKenna started to speak. Yeah, oh, yes. So I have a, I, I just struggle with this one because we've got, what do we have, 12 congressmen and two senators um, who are, you know, 
Ms. Levinson, uh, I think, inadvertently said this gives us a seat at the table, but I looked at my ballot and, and I voted for these people that are seat at the table, um, as we are the seat at the table for the people that we represent. So I struggle a little bit spending taxpayer money to lobby people that taxpayers uh, are paying salaries of. Um, I, I struggle with this a lot and I struggle with uh, paying, spending taxpayer money so that someone can contact the undersecretary of you know, uh, HUD uh, about a program when we should be looking for those things ourselves um, and being alerted by our Congress people. Um, I you know, question how much we are gonna get for $60,000 when Mercury is representing other municipalities. Um, and when we, you know, when we have no middleman, well, not only do we, you know, have a middleman because it's, we're paying somebody to do this, um, we, we also don't necessarily get prime seating because other municipalities are, are paying for their time as well. So the CARES Act is, you know, already kind of in process. Um, a lot of it's going to be written, you know, at the, at the department level um, <clears throat> once it's passed, God willing that they pass it. But I, I just don't, I don't know what, um, th this is a little too generic for me and, and if Mercury's then gonna go do interviews with, with uh, department directors um, then, and find out what their needs are. I mean, we, we're constantly creating this list of needs. We've had public events with needs and master plan events with needs. And now we're gonna go back and have more conversations with directors of needs. We've got more lists of needs. And I, I just think this is a not a very well clarified approach that we can just $60,000 and we're gonna have a pretty tight budget this year. I'm inclined to just put this on a wish list for another time when we got a lot of cash on our hands. If, if I could answer your question or respond to, to your comments, Councilman. Please do, yes. Yeah, so from, from the aspect of other clients, uh, one thing I would say about the firm is it's not a cookie cutter approach. Uh, that's one. Uh, having been in this space, uh, working for a member of Congress uh, for a number of years, um, having worked in the advocacy space as well for a number of years, uh, I, 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 would, I would say in my experience in dealing with whether it's lobbyists or those providing government services, government relations, it's the an opportunity uh, for, for your city uh, to not have to compete uh, with other municipalities uh, that are of same or larger sizes for the same part of, of money. It's also giving you an opportunity uh, to highlight some of, of your areas of concern uh, directly with people uh, that are addressing these, these matters. Again, outside of your members of Congress, uh, they have a role to play from the appropriations process. They have a role to play from a legislative process. Uh, but as it relates to a particular agency, since you're not in the era of earmarks anymore, and we haven't been in the era of earmarks for a long time, it is truly engagement with agencies and say, if there's a pilot program that's going to be done, um, let's make sure it's not going to those municipalities that have two or three million people in, in their city. Uh, how could we best collaborate and work for pilot projects, whether it's in DOT, again, whether it's in HUD, or whether it's in programmatic activities that may uh, improve the quality of life for your residents. So I would just say, Based on, based on the experience I've had directly um, with municipalities as an employee uh, and with Congress, I, I think the framework I would say is how could Mercury be an extension of your operation to make sure uh, that you are thought of along the process and not after the decision has been made. Well, I, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Middleton. I, I do, and, and I understand the earmarks, you know, history, and I understand the congressional side. I worked for Joe Kennedy, so I know that you know there are there are different people within congressional staff that are 
uh, responsible for different areas within the government, be it SBA, education, HUD, et cetera. Um, that's really their job is to be looking out for their municipalities within those departments, um, keeping an eye on things that are coming down the pike so that their municipalities that their congressperson represents um, are, are aware of what's going on. So if, if, if we're just leaving them to voting on appropriations and uh, some ancillary legislation, then you know, we're overpaying them like we're overpaying ourselves. Their, their job is to, is to advocate for us and, and send things down, um, you know, down the river to us. Um, this is the equivalent of, of working for a corporation and the, and the county department hires a consultant to you know, the building the maintenance department. I mean, I, I just think that, uh, that we're, we're outsourcing this instead of doing it ourselves. And, and quite honestly, the, the, the mayor should be in Washington educating numerous people. Our department heads should be uh, those departments at the federal level that impact them and working to make sure we get that those funds. And I appreciate your your answer for sure. But Mr. Middleton, and I I do as well, Mr. Middleton. I appreciate your willingness to uh, make yourself available to answer the questions that we have. Uh, with that said, do we have a motion? Uh, I have a follow up question. So move. Uh, let, let, let. Move. Okay. Well, we got a. I I didn't hear a second though. Second. No. Okay, clerk, can I have a roll call? Council members Davis? No. McKenna? No. McCray? Yes. Mills Ransom? Yes. Welch? Yes. Vice President Good? Yes. Council President Hockaday? Yes. I'm in favor to oppose resolution passes. Okay, Clerk, read 93 21. Resolution 93 21 authorizing claims resolution to issue a check in settlement of all claims in the matter of Deborah versus the city of Plainfield. Any questions from council members? Yes. Go right ahead, council. I am two months now, Mr. Mancella, without that report I asked for. So this this brings it back up because this is yet another settlement that the, the city is paying and I have not seen that information you were gonna to put together for me. It's been a month. That's correct, council president. I'm sorry, councilman. I will be, I, I'm still working on that report and I will get it to you. Okay, can I get a date? I ask um, if you need a week, it's a week. If you need two weeks, it's two weeks. I just need to, I need a day. We got to work towards the deadline here. We can't just do this every month. Um, if you provide me an additional two weeks, I will have that report to you. All right, two weeks from today. I appreciate it. Okay. Any other questions from council members? Do we have a motion? So moved. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition or abstentions? This resolution is approved. Resolution 9421 authorizing the transfer of appropriations for the calendar year 2021 budget to recover. Any questions from council members? Yes. Councilman McKenna? Two questions. One, um, is there a re you know, uh, um, trust accounts are considered budget items unless I'm mistaken. So is there a reason they're not on our, our budget, um, monthly budget reports as far as the current balances and what is the current balance of the um, storm recovery trust? Not including this transfer. I will have to send it to you because I'm not sitting with that information in front of me. And so I will send out to council tomorrow. Okay. And what then the current balance is on the storm recovery trust. And what, what about the other part of that, which is the, the general trust balances as far as being part of a monthly report? They're not dealt with that, that frequently. And we've got lots of trust accounts. Uh, we can certainly look to incorporate it, but it's not something that gets used that often. And you tend to see when it, when it's uh, used. 
You know, so if, if we're spending from a trust, you get a report that says this this person or this resolution is charged to a trust. Yeah, well, we're that we're making a we're making an appropriation out of a trust. We're not looking at the balances of those trusts. So that, that's two different things. That's you know, we're signing. No, it. we're we're moving it from a snow removal account to a trust account. You're moving from the snow removal to the trust. That is correct. And what's the balance of the snow removal? I don't have that in front of me either. I will include that when I send the report up. <coughs> Further questions from council? Hold on one sec. It's actually okay. 65,000 as of the beginning of the, um, are you, the February report that you sent. Um, and are we not using a lot of that? The reason for the transfer request is because of the magnitude of the snowstorms we've had to date. And the fact that we've had to bring in outside uh, companies to help with the snow removal. We're okay. trying to make sure that we're prepared to meet the needs of the city, uh, particularly in light of the fact that there are upcoming storms, you know, predicted to drop anywhere between four and eight inches of additional snow. Okay, I, I get that. So I'm, I'm, I must be not hearing you correctly because you just told me we were transferring it from the snow removal um, account to the storm recovery trust, which would be more of a long-term account. We got $65,000 in the storm recovery, snow removal. So we're, we're not moving it from snow removal? It is from snow removal to the storm recovery trust. So the storm recovery trust is for future long-term. Snow removal is for immediate budget period, right? It, it then gives us the flexibility to move it. Should we have a need in 2021 for additional funding, it, we will have the ability to move it from the Storm Recovery Trust to the 2021 budget. Even though we have $65,000 in this wow. removal account. Right? Correct. So we're gonna move 55,000 from snow removal into the trust so that we can move it back into snow removal should we have a snowstorm. We're talking about different years. This money is coming out of the 2020 account. Why don't we just move it into snow removal? We may do that. We may move it to the 2021 snow removal account. We have to wait and see what happens with additional storms. All right, I really appreciate your patience with that. And I would like to see the trust balances on the monthly report. Even though they're not touched a lot, I think it's uh, important that we see them. Balances. There could be uh, additions going in there on some of them based on some of these redevelopment accounts. We have a motion. Council President, uh, I have a question. Uh, oh, uh, uh, Let's back up then. Council right. President, good. Yes, uh, since we are uh, speaking about the S word, I just wanted to make a statement uh, in, in regards to the removal and um, kudos to the Department of Public Works on all their efforts in uh, during the storms that we have had in spite of uh, obstacles that may have come up, uh, I, did, I did a tremendous job in removing the snow throughout the city. So I just wanted to throw that in there uh, while we were on the subject of snow. Councilwoman Davis. Yes, um, so just a point of clarity. So we had extra money in snow removal from 2020 because it didn't snow like that. So we're now moving that extra money from 2020 to the storm recovery trust. And just in case we have more snow for 2021, we will move it from that trust to the snow removal for 2021. Is that what we're arguing here? That's correct. We are trying to be prepared in the event we have a need for additional funding to deal with snow removal. If we did not move this money from last year's budget to the trust, what would happen to it? At the end of this year, that money would then go into surplus. Thank you. Any further uh, questions from council members? I'll entertain a motion. Moved. Second. Second. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any, any opposition or abstentions? This resolution is approved.
Resolution 9521 authorizing approval to cancel the 2021 taxes build on block 112 lot 903. Any questions from council members? Yeah, I, have, I have a question on 95-21 and 96-21 and in, in, in both resolutions it stated that the tax assessor was not, uh, a collector was not aware or assessor was not aware of the um, the pilot agreement. Why, why, why were they not aware of the pilot agreement on these? I'm not so sure that I would say wasn't aware that, you know, that there is timing around these financial agreements. You know, that, that agreement could have been done two years ago or a year ago and that the triggers take place long afterward. So it's, it's really a matter of staying up uh, when certain events occur, you know, many of them are triggered by COs or the signing of an HMFA uh, loan agreement. Those are the triggers that then in those in these two financial agreements, they're the triggers that would say that those properties are now exempt and pilot agreements are in effect. And so what you're talking about is the tax collector would not be aware necessarily when a, a CO or a loan agreement was in, in place until he receives a notification, which is downstream, you know, and uh, wouldn't necessarily occur during the timing when we're preparing tax bills. And so once he is notified, he then has to take action. And so these two resolutions are, are there so that he can make adjustments to his books because now the financial agreements have kicked in. So the, so the, the wording of this, um, let's see here. While you look at that, any other questions from council members? You can still ask your question, Sean, once you find your place. I wanna see if anyone else has questions. All right, council member McKenna. Yeah, I'm just noticing that the resolution says that the tax collector's office was made aware of the exemption after the billing had been had taken place. Made yeah, aware, right? Okay. Uh, do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition or abstentions? This resolution is approved. Resolution 9621 authorizing approval to cancel the 2021 taxes bill on block 329, lot 18. Right, questions are probably similar from council members. Uh, any questions? Do we have a motion? Moved. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition or abstentions? Resolution is approved. Resolution 9721 authorizing approval to cancel the 2020 and 2021 taxes billed due to a 100% disabled veteran exemption. Scanning the screen for questions from council members. Hearing and seeing none, do we have a motion? Moved. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition or abstentions? The resolution is approved. Resolution 9821 authorizing City of Plainfield to enter into a one year renewal subscription with PAC Talk. Any questions from council members? I have one quick question. What account is this that we're moving it from? Because I noticed it's not on the budget report either. That's police, the dir police director. Director West is looking. I'm sorry. Oh. You said what account are we removing it from? Yes. Uh, it's in our operating budget. It's, That's right. it's, it's and already I'm... in our operating budget to, if we're on the resolution to enter in this maintenance agreement. And when I look at the budget report, how come I don't see that account on here? It ends in 240, correct? It should be a separate line in um, the police department's operating budget for 2021. Okay. So what the reason it's not on the budget report? Okay. 
listen, we, you know, you, you can double well, back for this one. At, at, yeah, because I'm not, months. I'm not fully understanding the question, but it's if well, every, every month we get a budget report and it shows money spent for that budget that that account id um the the total allocated for that account id how much has been spent what's remaining etc and that is not on there well it hasn't been paid as of yet be, until the resolution right. is passed if that's what well, you're asking if we're paying if we're paying monies out of that account that account has been allocated has been appropriated funds so if, if it hasn't been used it should sit there with the amount appropriated as the balance we, we will look and see, but uh, the, the normal thing that you see is salary and wages and OE. And uh, this is within the OE budget. Any other questions from council members? Can we have a motion? Move. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition or abstentions? The resolution is approved. Resolution 9921 authorizing the award of a professional service contract with Pannoni Associates. Questions from council members? I have a question. Hearing it. I'll go right ahead. Did, they, did go this come out to bid? I noticed that they, they said that they submitted a proposal. So did we ask other companies to submit a proposal? Proposal for what, Mr. Councilman? Will you? R099 21, Director. Yes, and you're saying the proposal for what? The proposal, this was a proposal. We, this is the engineering company we uh, went with for the services, engineering services. I know. I'm asking you in the thing, it says that they submitted a proposal. So did we ask just them to submit a proposal or did we ask other engineering companies of which I think there are a few more in the state to submit a proposal? Oh, this is the one we use from the list to get a proposal from right here. Okay, so how many other proposals did we get, Director? We didn't get any more proposals for this project. Okay, we just have- Council President, if, if I may just interject to say that- Sure. There is uh, no requirement that professional services uh, be subject to the local public contracts law. Sure. That once someone is pre-qualified, as in the case of Pannoni, is perfectly acceptable for the director to recommend a contract for council approval. So there's no requirement whatsoever that that be bid, as in the case of a lowest responsible bidder. Just want to clarify that for the council. I, I'm, I'm aware of that requirement. My question was, did we? Because just because you're not required to doesn't mean that it's not smart to do it and see if we can get a better price because there are other engineers on that list that we could have gotten a proposal from. So that's yeah. it. Okay. Any other questions from council members? Hearing and seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. So do. Second. Uh, clerk can have a roll call. Council Member Davis? Yes. Jenna? No. Bright? Yes. Ms. Ransom? Yes. Councilwoman Hilch? You're yes. on me. Yes. Thank you. Vice President Good? Yes. Vice President Hockaday? Yes. Tips in favor one. Proposed resolution passes. Resolution 121 authorizing approval to submit a grant application with the USA Swimming Foundation. Do we have questions from council members regarding this? Hearing and seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Yeah. Uh, clerk, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition or abstentions? I know that this resolution is approved. Resolution 101-21 authorizing approval to submit a grant application with the U.S. Conference of Mayors Dollar Wise Innovation Grant. Questions from council members regarding this resolution? Hearing and seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 The opposition or abstentions? None noted. This resolution is approved. Resolution 102, 21, recognizing February 12th through the 15th, 2021, Great Backyard Bird Count in the city of Plainfield. Uh, any, any questions from council members? Uh, I would just like to say I've already started counting, Council President. 
Too bad you missed the deadline. It was the 12th through the 15th. Today the 16th. Yeah, but but I I've been counting, Councilwoman. Okay. Uh, can I have a motion and a second, please? So moved. Second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition or abstentions? None noted. This resolution is approved. Resolution 103-21, supporting the placement of interpretive signs at the Drake House Museum. Any questions from council members or comments? Hearing and seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. So moved. Second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposition or abstentions? None noted. This resolution is approved. Resolution 10421, directing the planning board to reinvestigate 501 through 637 South Avenue to determine whether such property constitutes a condemnation area in need of redevelopment. Any questions from council members? I, I yeah. have a question. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Davis. No, go ahead. It's cool. Um, yeah, I'm curious as to the reason why we would uh, open up this redevelopment plan to um, I guess, are we opening up the redevelopment plan or is it in the area in need of plan? Because this area has a redevelopment plan, if I'm not mistaken, that I wrote on when I was on planning board. This is the, this is the Edward, Edward P. Paul building. Um, is there a reason we're suddenly giving them a condemnation? I thought this, the people that own this had a plan at one point that I saw when I was on the planning board. It was not an application, but they had submitted renderings of loft style apartments in those buildings. Uh, yes, uh, I've been working with them uh, on this particular project since I've arrived in Plainfield. Uh, we have not, and that would be a little over three years, we have not gotten any traction in terms of the development of this property. And so we do want to look at it as an area in need of condemnation. Uh, it is an eyesore, uh, uh, even though there's still operating a portion of the property. Uh, the property is about five acres and uh, we just haven't come to any conclusions about how to develop this property. And so without some further action, it will likely stay as is. And, and what is the, the downside to doing this? Uh, the downside is uh, litigation. Uh, in this case, if we were to go to uh, utilize eminent domain, uh, because that's what a condemnation area does uh, allow you to do, uh, that litigation would be paid for by a developer that would be interested in the property. Uh, but again, that's the downside. Any other questions? Councilwoman Davis, you had a question. Um, I think I had more of a concern. Mm -hmm. um, like I understand, you know, us wanting to redevelop um, certain areas of the city. But when we say things like um, it's an eyesore and that's why we're moving to use condemnation, it is a little concerning to me. Um, just because we don't like the way something looks doesn't mean that we should necessarily be issuing eminent domain to take it over and redevelop it. So I that do. is my only concern in using um, that sort of language when we're talking about uh, condemnation areas. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I probably should have said blighted. The property is blighted. It is a magnet now for graffiti. Uh, I'm constantly uh, calling uh, to ask them to clean up around that property. Uh, so it is a property that is currently blighted and very much so. I, I have I have a, uh, just a follow up, and it, it might be for Mr. Mincello. Uh, I'll let you all decide. But if if we do a condemnation designation, a developer, another developer is interested in it, attempts to buy it, can't negotiate it. We designate it. Um, uh, um, I just lost the word. Um, <laughs> what, what what did you use, Miss Jackson, for? Um, <laughs> So we use eminent domain, which forces negotiation. What is determined is the fair price off of three um, appraisals, et cetera, et cetera. But it ends up in litigation. And, and Ms. Jackson said that, that a, 
developer would pay for that, a developer who's interested in the property would pay for that. Is that an open-ended agreement or a, 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 a fixed agreement with that developer that they would have to pay that, those fees even if they lose the litigation? Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion? Yes, moved. Second. Second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition or abstentions? All right, this resolution is approved. Resolution 10521 designating. Resolution 10521 designating uh, Centurion Plainfield um, 1222 South Avenue Urban Renewal LLC as redeveloper for the redevelopment of certain properties identified on the tax maps of the city of Plainfield is block 625 lot two identified in the city tax maps 1622 South Avenue, commonly known as authorizing the execution of the redevelopment agreement in connection therewith. So literally, can you just repeat that? Cause uh, halfway through, don't even know what you said. Resolution 10521 designating Centurion Plainfield 1222 South Avenue South Urban Renewal as redeveloper for 121642 South Avenue and 1222 South Avenue. Any questions from council members? Hearing and seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition or abstentions? No. Okay. Uh, no council member McKenna's out there. Uh, nay vote. Six in favor, one opposed with McKenna voting uh, in the negative. Okay, thank you. Clerk, next resolution. Resolution 10621 designating certain properties as non combination redevelopment areas. Any questions from council members? Hearing and seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Move. Some second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition or abstentions? Hearing and seeing none, this resolution is approved. Resolution 10721, designating 234 East 9th Street as a non condemnation redevelopment area. Any questions from council members? Scanning the room, hearing and seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition or abstention? Seeing none, this resolution is approved. Resolution 10821 authorizing the execution of a parking lot use agreement with the city of Plainfield and East Front Street Offices LLC. Do we have questions from council members? Yes. Councilwoman Davis. Um, so BA Levinson, in the resolution, it says that this will generate money for the parking utility. So is the parking utility now up and running? And also, um, do we have to approve like salary ordinances for those new positions or are they just old positions that would just move from one department to another? So in terms of the positions in the parking utility, the titles are going to be titles that already exist, uh, parking enforcement officer and chief parking enforcement officer, which are already PMEA titles. So you're not gonna have to see those again. Um, in terms of does the parking utility already exist? Can you clarify what, I mean, do you mean, is it is it up and running? Yes. Okay, so it's not fully up and running yet. It's going to be, the, the parking utilities budget is going to be presented to you when we present the budget. So since we haven't done that yet and gotten those approvals, um, obviously a, lo a lot of it is at a standstill until that happens. However, we're preparing 
behind the scenes and we are getting ready so that once that budget comes to your attention, if we are granted the approvals that we need, we're ready to hit the ground running. So where would the revenue that this would, uh, that this would generate, where would that go until uh, the parking facility does have its own budget and stuff? The, the revenue that's created by the... By this current, so this current agreement, um, once this agreement is finalized, where would that revenue go? If the parking the parking utilities budget hasn't been created yet, I, I I'll let Director West speak to where revenue is held. Yeah, I well a couple of things. I I will make a minor adjustment to uh, what B. A. Levinson said about the budget. Uh, Council has already approved a temporary budget for the parking utility. The overall budget you will uh, get to see. You know, when we come forward with the budget for the year, but they do have a temporary budget. You know, uh, the revenues are basically going to come from, uh, you know, permits and meters. You know, the permit permits and meters that exist today, you know, that that revenue will now be associated with the utility. So this contract is included in that? Yes. Okay, so there's a temporary budget already. So all the revenue that comes from this agreement goes into that temporary budget. Goes into the parking utility revenue side of the budget. Okay, I think we said the same thing. Thank you. Any further questions from council members? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Move to the second. Okay, uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposition or abstentions? Uh, hearing none, this resolution is approved. Resolution 10921, amending resolution 31419 to extend the professional contract for the New Jersey Innovation Institute through December 31st, 2021. Uh, any more questions from council? I know we had opportunity earlier, but any questions? Do we have a motion? And a so moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition or abstentions? And seeing none, this resolution is approved. And resolution 11021 authorizing approval to submit a no local match required grant application with the New Jersey Story Preservation Fund. Any questions from council members? Hearing and seeing none, uh, I'll entertain a motion and a second. Moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition or abstentions? This resolution is approved. And Council President, we have a, a new item, uh, Resolution 11121, in which all the Council members have been notified. It's read it by title. It's a resolution uh, urging the legislature to oppose Assembly Bill A1571. Uh, uh, the text is in IQM2 as well. So uh, at this point, uh, you would need a motion and a second and affirmative votes to add this to the agenda and then a separate vote to um, adopt it. Okay. Can I have a motion and a second to add this to the agenda? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, do we have any questions from council members regarding this resolution? You have to vote. You have to put it on there first. There was a vote. Just did. Just did. Just moving it right. We didn't vote. Yeah. There was just, a motion and a second, and there was no vote. All those in favor? To move. Aye. 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 Any opposition abstentions? Opposed. Okay. Note one of one opposition. Do we note it? Kenna? The agenda. Okay, now it's on the agenda. Do we have any questions from council members? Yes. Councilwoman Davis. Um, so in the resolution, I see that the concern is that we won't have redevelopment if we if this, if this a bill allows for a prevailing wage to be paid um, 
for projects that receive pilots. However, what are the, aren't there more benefits to having union labor for projects and such? Well, certainly Councilman Davis, there are benefits to, you know, skilled or union labor on a project, but we do have to recognize that having more expensive labor will drive the cost of projects throughout the city. So what will happen is it will have a, a couple of, of outcomes. Either projects that would have been feasible and viable will no longer be viable in the city of Plainfield, or to offset those costs, developers are gonna require of us to have less pilots. So all we're really doing with this bill is shifting the, uh, the monetary burden from the, from the developer onto the backs of the taxpayers. So that's why the mayor opposes this legislation and he's asked the council to join in that opposition because he firmly believes, uh, and I see Director Jackson, she's nodding as well, that a bill such as this would have a, a detrimental impact to the city of Plainfield and the continuing revitalization that we have going on right now. I, uh, Director Jackson here, I agree with Dave. It is really the only tool uh, that is available to municipalities uh, to uh, incentivize uh, developers to come to our municipality. Uh, the state itself, so all we're doing is the state itself has other tools that are available to them, other financial programs, other incentives. And so if we were, uh, as Davis are articulated is that either development would stop because it's just not feasible, financially feasible to do a particular project paying union labor. I think what we're most interested in is making sure that the residents of Plainfield are employed on these projects. And if we are talking about prevailing wage and union labor, uh, unfortunately, a number of our residents are not part of the union. And we work with them uh, with programs such as New Jersey Bill to try to get our residents through uh, apprenticeship programs to become part of the unions. And so again, this uh, additional labor cost is not benefiting the city of Plainfield. So, so, so home deal, there's a lot unpack here so so what we're doing is we're 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 now we're now anti-union um oh, and, yeah. and we are working to put um a non-union workers our, our focus is to get local people hired on these projects even though we don't enforce it it's an on your honor system we do not check it we've had this conversation it's on video in previous council meetings so we are not that interested in it that we're going to put the effort behind it. I'd rather pay 60000 to track that than to pay Mercury uh, to consult or lobby for us when, when a lot of their people are giving donations to, uh, you know, Kelly Loeffler and, and stop the vote and stop the count and stop the steal uh, initiatives. I'd rather give 60000 to tracking how local developers are hiring um, our local uh, um, residents. But now we're talking in, in one sentence, we just talked about how that a lot of them are not union or skilled and, and in, in a union, but we're trying to get them into apprentice programs so that we can then get them in a union and not get them jobs locally. So I, for one, am not going to be given a bill, um, a, a resolution 30 minutes into or 20 minutes into a, a council meeting that is five pages long and has a lot of nuance to it. And the bulk of it is union busting and think that I'm going to even consider voting for that. I don't care if there's merits or not, there's no emergency on this one. And if there was, it should have been last month because this bill, it didn't just come out of nowhere. And we're not talking about union busting. Uh, the unions need to present competitive raises in the, for these projects. If you are, if you are eliminating them from, from uh, being involved and explicitly um, not having a prevailing wage, clause, then you are, it's an element of union busting. It is exactly that. Councilwoman uh, Davis, you had a question? Yes, I did. Thank you. So uh, Councilwoman, Councilwoman, Director Jackson, 
you um, stated that we have programs in place through NJ Build to get residents in the apprenticeship program to then work in the unions. Right. So if we had more programs like that and this uh, assembly bill passed, wouldn't that then give our residents more opportunities to work on projects because they are now in the union and they'll be paid a prevailing wage, which seems more like a fair and livable wage? It is not necessarily a fair and li livable wage. When I say that we're working to get them in the union, does not mean that we have been totally successful with that. So we have to look at the number of people we sent them, how many did uh, successfully complete the courses, and then how many of those then uh, successfully joined a pre-apprenticeship program, and then how many of those passed the test to be part of the unions. And so it is a much more complicated issue than simply saying we're gonna train our people. And the same thing about the use of local residents. I have managed programs where I've had a staff that does workforce training and development. And so the question to council is, uh, to Ms. McKenna's point is, is the council willing to fund what is necessary to have a viable workforce uh, training program and uh, tracking. And sure. that's the issue. You come up with a cost and what you're gonna cut to pay for it. Well, that's, that's I mean, you a, haven't proposed, all straight up. You haven't okay. proposed that. If there's new questions from uh, the council members, we can entertain those. If not- Well, I'll... I did have a follow-up question to right Director ahead. Jackson's point about right uh, programs to support uh, residents in that. So what type of programs do you think we should be funding in order to support residents getting into the units? So uh, some of those, uh, it's a long answer to that and I'd love to take that offline. I, I had a staff of uh, about six people doing workforce training and tracking and putting people in workforce into those jobs and giving them the wraparound services that they need to successfully become part of the unions. So I would love to talk to you about it offline. Let's talk tomorrow. Okay. I'll entertain a motion in a second. So moved. Second. Uh, clerk can have a roll call. Moved by Councilman McRae and seconded by Councilwoman Ms. Ransom. Council members Davis. No. McKenna. No. McRae. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Ransom. Yes. Councilman Welsh. Yes. Vice President Good. Yes. Vice President Hockaday. Yes. I'm in favor to oppose this resolution passes. Okay, thank you. Uh, we now come to ordinances on first reading. Clerk, will you please read MC 2021 05 by title? MC 202105 is an order amending chapter two, article nine by amending duties of the division of inspections and amending chapter two, article 10 to create the division of buildings and construction. Questions from council members? Yes. Councilwoman Davis, please. Um, how many other municipalities have a setup where the division of construction, the division of buildings and construction um, doesn't report to public works, but instead reports to economic development? VA Levinson. I can tell you that in Patterson, uh, where the municipality where I worked prior to Plainfield, the buildings and construction all, UCC all reported to economic development. And I think that that is more standard than the way that we have it here. Thank Especially you. when there's a lot of construction going on, which obviously in Plainfield there is. And I would add uh, Councilwoman Davis, when I was in the city of Orange, I managed the building and uh, construction as well. Additional questions? See you thinking, Councilwoman Davis. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I do have another question. Go right, go right ahead. Um, so how do we manage uh, checks and balances of having buildings and construction in the same, uh, under the Department of Economic Development who works with developers and who works uh, to get these redevelopment agreements um, together? So I think my real concern is, um, is there gonna be a check and balance to make sure that like, things are not getting pushed through so we can get projects going, but instead there's gonna be like thoughtful um, conversation and thoughtful dialogue around all of the projects that we have going on. Okay. Councilman Davis, I, I could address that one. All the individuals in the construction department are licensed by the state and they are beholden, they want to continue to work. They have to uh, adhere to the code of ethics set forth in their licenses. If they fail to adhere to those, uh, provisions and those ethical codes, they could be subject to discipline, not even by us, but by the state. So I think that their their allegiance is to their is to their license more than anyone in the city. And certainly, they would uh, if they failed to adhere to that code of ethics, uh, they'd have bigger problems than just Director Jackson. Yeah, and I would just add that uh, to what Dave is saying, that they are governed by the Uniform uh, Construction Code of the state. And the only way that their decisions can be overturned is through the Construction Board of Appeals. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are licensed individual. They pro provide quarterly and annual reports to the Department of Community Affairs. Uh, so it is monitored in terms of the work that they do. The benefit of having them in, um, in economic development has more to do with alignment and early on understanding kind of what projects are coming down the pipe so that they can prepare for those. So how does this separation of buildings and construction and the Department of Inspections, how does that, does that benefit the residents? How does that benefit the residents? And how does that all work in making sure that everybody is on the same page when it comes to uh, not only large developments, but also single family homes, multi-family homes, apartments, all of the different types of real estate that we have in the city. So uh, building and construction uh, is only involved in uh, new construction or, or rehab. Uh, and so uh, property maintenance is around uh, the property maintenance code. And so the code that, again, that the building and construction is using is the uniform construction code. It's not the uniform fire code. It's not our property maintenance ordinance. It is the uniform construction code. And as Dave has said, they are licensed to do that work. And they make decisions based on that license. Okay, so the second part of my question was, how does this benefit residents? The alignment, <laughs> I think the alignment uh, ensures that these projects and all of these activities are happening smoothly and quickly. How does that benefit residents? Uh, again, when we turn the key, it's when we can start build, billing these pilot payments, which are typically more revenue. So it does benefit the uh, residents to have uh, these projects turnkey and that there is alignment throughout the whole organization about moving these things forward. Just to add that it's also going to really increase our efficiency um, because right now if a problem comes in to inspections, right, the first thing we have to do is weed out is this code enforcement inspections? Is this gonna to go to that team? Is this gonna to go to building and construction? Whereas now there'll be two separate entities. So a resident will go directly to the entity that is responsible. So you don't have that first weeding out process, which could take however long it takes. And then the second thing is that the division of inspections, obviously being under the Department of Public Works, makes a lot of sense because if a problem comes into the division of inspections or if a problem comes into the Department of Public Works, they, they are able to fix that problem. 
Now, with the division of building and construction, it's often Director Jackson who finds out about a CO issue or a subcode official issue. It often those come her way. And then her next step is to bring that to Director Dabney, who then brings it to his step. So instead of having that, you know, not that Director Dabney is a middleman, <laughs> but instead of having that, you know, waiting period where one director brings it to another, then that director brings it to his staff. It's just going to be a direct line of communication. So it'll increase efficiency and, and responsiveness, really. So let, let me ask this. How does creating two different groups or putting these two, because they were different before, they were just under the same umbrella. How does moving one to one area and another to another one um, make it easier for the residents? How are they going to know what's what? Because they didn't know what was what before based on the terms. So are we, are we labeling them differently? Are we changing something somewhere that's going to explain that to them? Well, we're changing the, the code in this resolution, in this ordinance, but also our, the website will be changed. All of our communications will be changed because it's a, it's a brand new division. As of right now, the division does not exist. Right. I would also add to, to that question is the way I would explain it is anything that you want to do for with your property, you should go to economic development. So if you plan to add steps, uh, put in a roof or a deck, you should be going to economic development. My people actually spend more time with the construction official and the subcode officials than probably property maintenance. So the zoning officer is always talking with the construction official. The planners are talking with the construction official and those subcode officials. So those conversations would be facilitated better by being in the same department. So from a resident's perspective, anytime you're making an investment in your property, you should see economic development. It's a very simple equation. So anytime you're making, if you're putting in a new boiler, whatever it is, you should see economic development. No. Director Dabney, oh, you're muted. He's on mute. Oh, did you want to say something, Director Dabney? I'm just going to say the property maintenance inspectors will just be dealing with all quality of life issues that exist in terms of the city, internal and external. That's what they'll be doing. Okay. All focus. Thank, thank you, Director. I'll, I'll entertain a motion to adopt this ordinance on first reading. So move. Is there a sure. second? Okay, Clerk, may I have a roll call? Moved by Councilman McCray, seconded by Councilman Mills Ransom. Council Members Davis? Yes. McKenna? Yes. Right. Yes. Ms. Ransom? Yes. Welsh? Yes. Mr. President Good? Yes. Mr. President Hockaday? Yes. The ordinance has been adopted on first reading. Handle uh, MC 2021-06. MC 2021-06, an ordinance to amend chapter 16 vehicles and traffic, article seven for streets, stop intersections, stop and yield intersections, designating certain four-way stop intersections to remove four-way stop signs at the intersection of Rock Avenue. Okay, uh, discussion, questions from council members? Yes, council president. Uh, I would like to, just for the record, if uh, Director Burgess can explain to the public what the alternatives will be. Yes. Um, so there was a, an assessment done by the police department um, in 2019. And um, due to complaints that we received in regards to the congestion that that four-way stop sign created, um, and over that time period, uh, it was creating um, a, a great amount of uh, congestion, especially during rush hour in the morning and the evening, which created some safe, which, which had some safety concerns. Um, so with that being said, um, we are replacing the stop signs that are on the Rock Avenue side um, with other safety signs that will then give the speed, will show the speed as uh, when you're approaching those intersections. 
um, which basically is a um, basically a deterrent for slowing down at that particular area um, to be able to still um, serve the needs of the, the original reason why the sign was put, why the four-way stop was put there. It's just that the four-way stop sign in a heavily traveled area is can create the problems that it has created for us in that area. There are times that that area, um, if you have gone down there, can get backed up all the way to 22. Um, especially around that five o'clock evening, maybe not as much during the pandemic, um, but during that uh, 2019, 2018, it was a big problem there and it created some safety concerns. So this four-way intersection has not been abandoned. You are using an alternative way to solve the problem. Just yes. for the record, so, just so that they understand that. Yes, that mm -hmm. we have safe, we have other safety signs that are going to go up there on Rock Avenue to replace the stop signs. They're, the stop signs are being removed just from the Rock Avenue side with other safety signs being placed there. Thank you, Director. You're welcome. Wait, wait I guess I'm confused. So we're not eliminating the four-way stop, we're just making it a two-way stop? It was always a two-way stop before it was a four-way stop. It was always a stop sign at the Myrtle Avenue side. That's right. Okay. Um, so we're going back to the original. We're going yes, we're going back to the original way that it was, but adding the safety speed signs that that give you the flashing with your speed limit as you're coming down. At, at what what point does an intersection call for a light, generally speaking? Um, there would have to be a traffic study done on that particular area. Um, I would have to go back to see what was done prior to when they put the four-way stop because I was not here or I was not the director at that time. Um, but it would have more to do with the if there's accidents and things like that. And also keep in mind right there at Rock in front, there is a stop sign there as well. I'm sorry, there is a uh, traffic signal there as well. Um, so the distance also can also be a concern as to having one stop sign and then one right back to back. Um, but um, in this particular case, the initial reason was they originally put the four way stop sign there. Um, but it is definitely has and and over the last year or actually almost two years now since 2019. Um, I looked further into four-way stop signs and, and the areas in which they should be in. And it should be one of those areas that are kind of a road less traveled and Rock Avenue is a main travel area to and from the highway of 22. And that's why we're getting such a, a buildup of traffic there. I'm not sure if I totally answered your question, but. Yeah, well, any other questions? Questions from council members? Yes. I mean, go ahead, councilwoman. Um, Director Burgess, I'm not sure if I heard you correctly, but did you say that there was not a traffic study done um, for this area? We're just simply putting it back to the way it was? No, what I said was done in 2019 was a traffic assessment by our traffic division. A traffic study is, is different. That's actually done um, uh, be above the police department. Um, but this was a traffic assessment that was done. The officers, they do counting of vehicles, they check for accidents, um, they, they monitor and spend time there. Um, and looking at that, it was an area of congestion that was a, along with the complaints, because what brought us to that area is the constant complaints from the citizens in that area. And then from the complaints was the assessment that was done. Um, uh, in from several months within 2019. Um, and this just became a period of time where then the we started to put in place to remove the traffic sign and then the pandemic happened and then we just, you know, finally are getting to that point. We had to order the, uh, I did not want to have that, uh, the signs removed back to normal without having some other safety feature in that area. Thank you, because I do remember bringing this up to the council president and the clerk last year, and um, the feedback was there had to be more research done. So I'm glad the necessary research was done in order to fix this, because this was a major headache and complaint of residents. So thank you for the work that your staff did for this. Thank you. 
Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, clerk can have a roll call. Moved by Vice President Good, seconded by Councilman Davis. Council members Davis. Yes. McKenna. Yes. McCray. Yes. Ms. Ransom. Yes. Rose. Yes. Vice President Good. Yes. Council President Hockaday. Yes. Unanimous ordinance has been adopted on first reading. Okay, move to MC 2021-07. MC 2021-07 is an ordinance of the city of Plainfield and the county of Union authorizing the execution of a financial agreement with Centurion Plainfield, 1222 South Avenue, uh, Urban Renewal LLC, a granting a tax exemption with respect to certain properties identified on the city's tax map as block 625, lot two, identified in the city's tax records as 1216-342 South Avenue. What questions do we have from council members? Uh, council President, I actually uh, make a motion to table this ordinance. And the reason I'm making that motion is that the financial agreement was not attached to the agenda. So nobody on the council has seen the, uh, the financial agreement. Okay, there was a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, clerk, can we have a roll call on the motion? Davis? Yes. McKenna? Yes. McCray? No. Ms. Ransom? No. Welsh? No. Vice President Good? No. President Hockaday? No. Five in favor, two opposed. Sorry, five opposed. Uh, two, 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 yes. two opposed, five in favor. Yes. Two, two, two in favor of five opposed. The motion fails. <laughs> uh, are there other questions from council members? Yeah, I have a question. How, how are any of you going to make an assessment on this without seeing the financial agreement? How, how are you going to fulfill your fiduciary responsibilities to the people you represent without seeing the financial agreement? Anybody? I thought you can ask questions to the directors. I mean, this I'm, is not no, no, I'm asking my colleagues who are going to vote on a tax exemption that affects the citizens, and you have not even read the financial agreement because it is not attached. We don't have the financial agreement. It's supposed to be part of the packet. You have to read the financial agreement to understand the resolution. We don't have that. So how are you all gonna, how are we going to- Like I said, sir, you can you can ask the director's question. No, I'm asking you all. How, yeah, def my motion was to- Counselors are free to ask, and, you know, answer your question. And, you know, they can well, my, ask my, it or not. It's up to them. To, my motion was to table this until we got the proper information. And then- No, and it failed. Time. But instead, yeah. We, you all are going to vote on something without seeing the financial document. Okay, I mean, your question was registered. Council members are free to answer or not. It's, it's the prerogative. And does anybody, any council member have questions for uh, the directors? I do have a question. Councilwoman Davis. Uh, Director Jackson, um, while I wouldn't have used Councilman McKenna's words, he is making a valid point that the financial agreement is not, the link is not present on the website. So if it is, if it is all possible, can you email that over to us? Um, so we can at least be better prepared for when it's on the agenda for the second reading. Uh, yes, I will be glad to uh, send it over to you. I don't know why it wasn't attached. I will say though, that all the resolutions are reviewed ordinances, uh, our review with the economic development committee prior to council meeting. And so three of the members of this team have uh, heard the review uh, already. And it's also reviewed with the uh, council president and vice president uh, by the BA as well as myself. Uh, issues happen. Um, it, it is what it is. It's not- I'll send it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clark? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking in the IQM2 system uh, that we use for the software. It, it, it appears that it was a, a generation issue in terms of loading because it is there. You just cannot click on it. But also just to be reminded that ordinance require uh, two readings and a hearing. So there is opportunity for council to get it prior to voting on uh, 
finally during its final adoption. Thank you. I appreciate that. I literally just said that, but thank you for that explanation, <laughs> Mr. Clerk. <laughs> I was I was making sure that that uh, Director Jackson wasn't getting the blame on this uh, being attacked. She did uh, submit it, and for whatever reason, the link isn't working. Was and I literally said technical issues happen, but thank you for that great mansplaining of what I just said. Mansplaining. <laughs> I just said it. I'm, but I'm I appreciate it. <laughs> got you there. I just you know just just leave it at that. All right, um, can I'll entertain a motion. So move. Second. All right, can I have a roll call? Uh, Council members Davis. No. McKenna. No. McCray. Yes. Mills Ransom. Yes. Welch. Yes. Vice President Good. Yes. Council President Hockaday. Yes. And the favorite proposed resolution has been adopted on first reading. Okay, clerk, move to MC 2021-08. MC 2021-08 is an ordinance to exceed the municipal budget appropriation limits and to establish a cap venue. Any questions from council members? Yes. Council so Right. How would establishing this cat bank affect? Yes, wait, yes, before yes, I ask yes, the question, yes. the I did ask you last year, but I have a different question this year. Thank you. So the cat bank is for appropriation side. Is that correct, Mr. West? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Never mind. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, I was getting ready to say the same thing. <laughs> Is this thing on? <laughs> was it? Did you, did you, was your question answered, Councilman? Yes, it was. Okay. All right, hearing and seeing no additional questions, uh, I entertain a motion. Move. Move. And a second. Did you get a second, Clerk? Mr. Did Clark? I, hear, I heard the uh, motion by Vice President. Heard, heard the movement, not the seconder. Second. Okay, uh, Clerk, can I have a roll call? Council Members Davis? Yes. McKenna? No. McCray? Yes. Ms. Ransom? Yes. Welch? Yes. Mr. President Good? Yes. Council President Hockaday? Yes. In favor, one opposed, or this has been adopted on first reading. Okay. All right, we now move to general comments. A uh, total of 60 minutes has been allocated for all public comments to be presented. Each speaker will be allotted five minutes. If you wish to be heard, hit the hand icon or pound nine if you're a caller, uh, give your name and address for the record. Uh, the floor is now open. I have to promote Sam over because she has the older version of Zoom. Okay. Miss Cooper. I'm here. Name and address for the record, uh, good evening. Sam Sakitha Cooper, 90 Brokaw Boulevard, Plainfield, New Jersey. I wanted to make a suggestion for the dates of the meeting moving forward. As a community member, advocate, not only for the city of Plainfield, but for the Board of Education, the parents, the administrators, it's kind of hard to attend and participate in both meetings. I literally was just on the Board of Education meeting and rushed back over here to try to continue to be a part of the city council meeting. Now that you have reduced this to once a month, could it be possible 
for you to consider changing the date, um, amending the date to any other day other than Tuesday. I know that's a stretch as you've already, you know, mapped out the days that you're going to have, um, you know, for the year. And I see Ron shaking his head like, yeah, that's probably not going to happen. But I'm just asking as someone who is committed to trying to be a part of things that are extremely important within the city, the school district, the community is important. And so are the issues that pertain to running the city and being a part of the environment and the econ um, economy within the city. So just something to think about. The other part to this is if we're trying to be transparent and we are trying to be inclusive, is it possible that we could live stream our city council meetings to perhaps the uh, either the Plainfield city website or the Facebook page? Is that a possibility so that more people can participate? Some people I think may be afraid to speak up or log in. I know there's an opportunity for you to send in messages um, and for them to be read. I don't know if that's something that has been going on and maybe there are things that are spoken that some of the council members may speak about and address. But I'm hoping that moving forward as we're still going to be in this pandemic environment, as we are still going to be virtual, that we can work on more ways to be transparent and communicate better and effectively for the city. Um, I'm not sure if um, one of the residents have spoken about it, but I can tell you specifically on Watson Avenue, there is a concerned homeowner, and this is within the block where the post office meets Netherwood. The house is two or three houses from Netherwood. This particular home has been, um, and I'm going to say eyesore because I can, has been an eyesore to the residents that live near it. There's tarps on the roof. There are abandoned vehicles. And yes, this particular resident has spoken to uh, the department or the division of inspections. However, they keep being met with, for their words, excuses as it pertains to remediation. And this is not something that happened during the pandemic. This was going on prior to the pandemic with the abandoning of cars. Um, there has now been a rodent situation where this person had to hire an exterminator. So there's definitely some quality of life issues as it pertains to this particular house. Again, not putting that house number out there. You guys can check the records on your own, but that's something that they wanted me to share with you as they did not, um, feel they had a voice publicly in order to be able to disseminate that information. So that's all I have. I wish you all well. I hope you all are continuing to stay safe. And I'm hoping that um, we can come up with a resolution so that citizens who are wanting to be a part of both entities within the city can do so without being pulled between which one is more important for that evening. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and contributions. We'll certainly take a look at that. This, you know, this Tuesday is an aberration. It's after a holiday. Most of our meetings are on Mondays. But I'll ask the clerk to take a look at what other meetings we have after a holiday, which would put us on a Tuesday to see if it conflicts with the uh, school board calendar. Uh, and who's next? Uh, DC is your initials. Name and address for the record. My name is Daniel Cohn, 815 Field Avenue. I hope everybody can, he everybody can hear me. Yes, we can, thank you. Well, uh, my, first, my first concern is, is the division of inspections. As, as a Plainfield Board of uh, Ed Administrator, I've gone out and done a lot of home visits. A lot of the houses are five, six, 10 people families deep in the houses. In 1998, I witnessed two families over Christmas lose the kids and their families because of fires. I know the code, the code requires the fire, fire division to go out and do inspections when, whenever there's a new rental. 
But right now in the city of Plainfield, there's too many houses that are not being inspected. And I want to try and prevent a tragedy from happening and push the directors to increase the amount of inspections that are happening because the houses in Plainfield definitely are not getting inspected, especially the rentals. My second question goes out with the pilot programs. We as the citizens are given too, money, too much money up to pilot programs. And I'm gonna go back to one of the directors and I'm not sure who, what her name is. It's not about six or seven residents getting onto the union and getting jobs for the union as far as playing for residents. I think the taxes outweigh the benefits for the, bar, for the city as a whole than, than an individual. My last question, and I know it's, an, it's out there because I run and jog a lot in the city of Plainfield, the sidewalks, especially on the rentals, 7th Street, East End, West End, they're awful. And we, we talk about inspections. Listen, I got a fine on my house for peeling paint. We talk about sidewalks and safety of people on, 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 in, in, in our community. Let's be fair, sidewalks, peeling paint and certain things, we need to look at the, the grand perspective of how our inspections are going out and doing things. Um, and I'm saying that I, I've been in Plainfield for 25 years. My, my father was on the planning board. Um, and city council. And we need to look at how we, we are doing things and what is in the benefit of everything. Um, and, I, and those are my, those, those are my questions. It's like, I never want you lost life. I'd rather, I'd rather as a resident pay more money into inspections to do things right than losing kids. I've been around, I'm still in education and what I've seen doing home visits during COVID, I'm appalled. I'm appalled that our city has not held the expectations within the code. And if you've never lost a child or a child burning in front of you, going out in a rescue, you will never understand that. So, those are my comments tonight. I know it's not five minutes. I have one more other comment to make, but I say that to say is like division inspections, the rentals and the homes in Plainfield, the way I'm seeing the residencies when I'm going out there doing home visits as a administrator in Plainfield, I can't tell you what I've seen. It's crazy. Council President, this time is up. The code is every new rental Thank you, DC. is supposed to have an inspection. Thank you. Appreciate your comments, sir. There's the Galaxy S8. Not sure what your name is, but please state your name and address for the record. Unmute yourself. I can't say the name because your name is Galaxy Galaxy S8 Plus. You have that phone and it's you who's next up for public comment. Unmute yourself, uh, give you one more opportunity or we'll go to the next, uh, next individual. All right, let's, uh, let's go to the next person. Quick, quick comment, Council President. Could somebody maybe IT just send that person a chat to let it know let them know it's them they may not know that's their how they're coming up all right Ms. Good evening. i'm sorry 
Welcome again. Thank you. Uh, Nicole Mingo Horton, 1366 St. Nicholas Boulevard. Thank you. Um, there were just a couple of things that uh, I wanted to speak about. One of them was um, snow removal. Uh, we've gotten a lot of snow in the past week and a half or so. Uh, and a lot of times when we get a big snow, um, especially on my street, it's a small street, um, the snow plow, because there are a lot of people parked on the street, can only come down the middle of the road. So a lot of times, even though some of the residents get their cars off the street, other residents don't. Uh, and we end up with a bank of six to eight feet of snow from the curb out to where the road is actually plowed because the plow is unable or does not um, swing in closer to the curb. And I get the robocalls and I know that the police department asks people to please get their cars off the road. But I also know that there are many residents that are not getting those robocalls. Um, I know that I years ago signed up for them. I don't know if it's still an opt-in system or if it's something that's automatically done. Um, but a lot of people don't have, uh, don't have landlines. Um, but if we can do a better job of trying to communicate to people to get their cars off the road, get them in driveways, maybe ask a neighbor if they could park in their driveway so that the streets can get plowed better because then it becomes a safety hazard because here we are almost you know two weeks later and the snow has really not gone anywhere and we're projected to get even more snow so it's just going to get worse. Uh, so if there's something that we can try to do, I know it may be cost prohibitive, to try to come back through, you know, a week or two later to clear up some areas where you weren't able to get in close enough. Um, but if we could try to work on that to make things beneficial, more beneficial for everyone, because there are a lot of people that do have to park on the street, but their cars end out in the middle of the road, and then you can't get even get down the road to actually drive down the road. Uh, so that was one thing. And the second thing is um, I wanted to get some clarification on what the status is with the dog licensing. Um, I sent my paperwork in so that I wouldn't have to pay a late fee uh, last month. But as of yet, I have not heard anything. So and I haven't seen uh, anything or gotten any notices or anything saying uh, what the status is on that. So if we could just have an update on that process or where it is. Uh, I would appreciate it. Um, the last thing is I'm going to go back to the four way stop signs again. Uh, I know that traffic is lighter now because of COVID and a lot of people are working from home. Um, but I have to reiterate again that I do believe that the intersection at Rock and Myrtle needs a traffic light. I understand it's close to front and rock, but maybe those two lights could be synchronized to improve traffic better. And I still believe, even though I didn't get the results of the traffic survey before, that a traffic light is needed at George Street and Leland Avenue because it's di very difficult for people to get out of George Street. I mean, get out of, get off of George Street onto Leland. The stop sign helps, but people are still running them when they're on Leland Avenue and not paying attention and thinking that they always have the right of way. So that's all that I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Mr. James Scruggs. Uh, you can be heard now. Please give your name and address for the record. And, uh, yeah, um, James Scruggs, 125 Lafayette Place. Are you hearing me? We are hearing you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and thank you, um, Councilman Good, for giving me the link to this. Otherwise, I would not be here. Um, I live, as I said, on 125 Lafayette Place. It's a little dead end street um, between Plainfield and Grant next to Waynewood Place with next to Marino's. And um, the street is overcrowded with cars. I understand people need to have cars to live. Um, but I wonder what will happen if I or someone on my end of the block which is uh, near the, the railroad track uh, needs an emergency vehicle because emergency vehicles cannot get down the street with cars parked on both sides of the street. 
Uh, we had a recent incident where a, a tow truck, I mean, uh, the uh, plow could not get down the street. There's also no fire hydrant down here. So I don't know what the solution is. Um, if we make it, uh, it used to be parking on one side. I think that would probably be an unpopular decision, but it would make it safe. I'm not sure what the solution is, um, but I uh, wanted to bring it to the attention of city council before something tragic happens, because if an emergency vehicle is needed at the end of my street, uh, I'd be out of luck. Um, the other thing is that um, I was uh, given a, a, a certified letter, um, but by the time I was able to sign it and it got back to me, it was too late. Um, it was about the uh, apartment buildings that are being built on Waynewood Park and Plainfield Avenue. Um, so in addition to my um, uh, one little dead end street being over, over, over uh, crowded with parking, when I get to the corner, um, I can't see out to, to pull out onto Front Street because cars are parked right up into the corner. And now there's going to be an apartment building, a five story with 316 apartments, which are gonna be built on West Front Street and Plainfield Avenue in the former Marino's spot. It's 316 apartments and 371 parking spaces. I would imagine that it would not be unusual for each apartment to have two vehicles. So instead of uh, 371 parking spaces, um, 632 would be needed, which means there'll be 261 missing spaces, which means that my block is gonna be even more crowded and more dangerous. Um, and I'm wondering what, I mean, how did that come about and what can be done? And um, is there a solution for uh, emergency vehicles to get to the end of the block? Could we put another hydrant at the end of my block? Um, um, it's a, this is just, I, 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 I'm bringing this up now because I spoke to Councilman Good, um, because I mean, God forbid nothing has happened so far, but should something happen, I don't know how um, an emergency vehicle will get down here. And with the new apartment buildings coming in, it's just gonna be more crowded. I have a question for Mr. Scruggs. Scruggs, uh, hey James, a question for you on your street. How, how many of those, uh, are, are all of those cars your neighbors or does that commercial facility, are, the, are there employees parking there? The commercial facility is uh, pretty much dissolved. It's, it's, it's my neighbors. Um, my neighbors don't all park on the, in their driveways for whatever reason, I'm not sure what that's about. Um, but um, there's, uh, there's not enough spaces um, now, I mean, right now to get out of my driveway with the snow drifts, it takes, you know, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth yeah. to get to get out now. And it's frightening to think about what's gonna happen when the uh, the apartment building comes. All right, thank, thank you, Mr. Scruggs. Uh, continue to work with uh, the councilman on that issue. And, uh, you know, I'm councilman good, make sure he's in touch with the director to follow, continue to follow up on the issue because he certainly raised some, some valid and pressing concerns. I have been in touch with him on uh, numerous occasions and we have uh, had extensive conversations. So I am aware of some of the, some of the things and um, I have been in touch with uh, the, the departments that are would be able to handle. Thank you. So. Thank you, Council. All right, Ms. Ms. Kuntz, uh, unmute yourself and give your name and address for the record. Uh, good evening, Sharice Kuntz, 141 McKinley Place. Uh, I actually just have one item that I want to bring forward to the council today, and I, I am glad to see that uh, we've opened up, well, I don't know if you guys would consider it, but I do, opened up the discussion again about the four-way stop signs. Um, I know that uh, when the uh, council and the, the city were having discussions, I believe that was back in 2019, about the four-way stop signs, I had advocated for a four-way stop sign at the corner of uh, East 2nd Street and Johnston, East 2nd and Johnston Avenue. Um, and uh, Director Burgess, I would just say, um, you know, I would like you to have your officers or, or your department take a look at that intersection again. 
uh, on East Second Street. Uh, there is a there is a traffic light at East Second and Berkman. The next time that traffic has to stop is at East Second and Leland. Now the speeds at which people get to just on that stretch of East Second Street it's it's dangerous sometimes. I live on McKinley Place, which is a little dead end street uh, between Berkman and and um, and Johnston Avenue and. You know, like uh, the the one the respondent that Mr. Scrubs was talking about uh, before me about getting out of your street because of the because of it being dangerous. I I have that same issue uh, traveling out of McKinley Place. Sometimes in the morning it's very dangerous because the the cars are just flying down East Second Street. So I mean, I would I would implore you to please take a look at uh, possibly a four way stop sign at Johnston Avenue and East 2nd Street. You know, normally I'm sitting out on my deck in the summertime and there's at least two accidents um, on that block or on that corner every summer. Um, and, you know, one year uh, a child got hit at that corner as well. So that's a very dangerous intersection there. So I would just, you know, like for you to take a look at that intersection again. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your, your, your contributions and your, your eyes and ears. It's, all, it's very helpful. Okay, Austin Bailey. Hi, it's Garnell Bailey, and I'm calling from 708 Spooner Avenue in Plainfield. Um, my issue is, and it goes back to 2012, when we, as part of this community, reached out to Mr. Neerstadt all to no avail. Um, fast forward to December 13th of 2019, um, we were threatened in terms of public service cutting off the street lights. So I got involved, I contacted the mayor, our neighbors got involved. Long story short, we put together a letter with signatures we gave um, Councilman McCray, who's been wonderful, uh, a copy of the letter and asked that city council help us um, become a dedicated uh, street to the city versus something um, private. Long story short, um, Mr. Mincello, who had been so kind as to reach out to, to me and assign my request to one of his attorneys, um, Mr. Mata. Uh, and we've gone back and forth, back and forth. Um, I've done everything that they've asked us to do myself as well as my neighbors um, from getting title searches, um, reactivating the HOA that's been like re retired for years. Um, I at, reactivated it um, in September and I mean, everything, soup the nuts, title search, you name it, only to have to continuously follow up, follow up. Mr. Mata doesn't call back. He doesn't reply to the attorney that's charging us $250 an hour and it's going on and on and on. And oh, by the way, he finally gets back to me and says that the administrators at City Hall um, have denied our request um, to become part of the, um, to have our street dedicated to um, the city. And which was really interesting because back in October, the attorney sent Mr. Mata the documents from the title company that basically says we've been paying taxes twice. Our meets and bounds says that we pay tax from from our homes to the middle of the street, which should basically cover the street lights too. Um, but the administration did not take the time to actually look into all the details. I believe I'm just getting these um, blase responses because I'm writing and CCing the mayor and, 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 and the city councilman. What can we do? It's, it's like, 
we're going around and around in circles. We pay taxes. All of our taxes are current. We get nothing from the city. I don't understand. I, I don't understand what it is we need to do. All these years, they've been sending bills for taxes to God knows where. We look up and, oh, there's a lien from the city against the HOA. Well, the HOA hasn't been in existence for years. I just activate, reactivated it in September. Now we got an $8,000 electric bill. I don't know how much in taxes, a total of 20,000 in outstanding taxes, but outstanding to what avail? The city needs to really do something to, to straighten it out. And they're not helping. It's costing myself and the other um, taxpayers, the other homeowners here, but we don't even have a street sign. I mean, we need some help. Or what do we do? We, we just let the HOA go again? And then who who's it on? I mean, they, they write a letter saying that this is something that happened in 2003 when the development um, group decided to build. Okay, well, this is 2021 and I didn't buy until 2009. I don't care what it said then, we're in trouble now. So do we just do nothing? I, I need city council's help. I can't, I can't obviously depend on the administration. I've been working with you. I don't even want to be on this call, but guess what? I'm getting nothing. Mr. Mata barely returns the phone calls, but every time he does, it's only after I write to the mayor. Mr. President, the speaker time is up. Okay. Uh, can I can I ask a question about this, no. Mr. Mancello? Because um, no. I'm no, guessing. Mancello, you, you, did you want? Let's we usually reserve after all the residents have spoken, and then we can give an opportunity I'll, for I'll Mr. Mancello or whoever to, to do. I don't want to interrupt the residents who've been waiting uh, to to speak. I would like answers to things. Okay. Uh, Miss Jones, please state your name and address for the record. Yes, um, 616 West 4th Street, that's Terry Briggs Jones. Um, <clears throat> good evening, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm actually uh, coming on because I had a concern and then I also had a question and then I also had a solution. And, uh, and my question is, um, um, I just wanted to know how was the information and how is the information disseminated regarding the COVID-19 immunizations? And the reason why I'm asking is because my mother is a senior and she took her shot, her first shot already, which was in another county. And then I had relatives also that took their shots as well. What I'm saying, what I'm saying is, although I seen on the tap in two, they were saying county, county is good, but we gotta be concerned about the local level, the residents that are here that are in the third ward, the fourth ward, the second ward, the um, third, wherever, wherever you live in the city of Plainfield. So I was just wondering because my mom's friend also, she wanted to take the shot. She's a senior and I know that she's eligible to take the shot. However, she didn't know what to do. And I just happened to uh, be in my mother's company at the time. So I told her, I said, let me, I said, let me find out and let me research it for you and let me see what's what. So I noticed that one of the places was in, um, was the, the health center. But I also found out about Plainfield High School, which I did not see. No, I didn't see it posted anywhere. So I just happened to find out about Plainfield High School. So I said, okay, let me just find out about that also as well. So with that being said, she doesn't know how to work a computer. She's not internet savvy. She's not computer savvy at all. So I'm going to assist her and a few other seniors that need the help because they want to take this vaccination because they are scared. So I said that to say this is, my question is to anyone that wants to answer it. How are the seniors being notified? Even the ones that used to come to the senior center or if they're still coming to the senior center, I don't know if their capacity is at 15%, 20%, 30%, 50%, whatever their capacity, how are they being notified? Are they getting 
um, paperwork, like flyers or something? Do there is there some type of kiosk set up so that way, um, let's just say um, something comes up at another place where they can take shots, and and maybe Mrs. Mabel who want in that shot, there's something set up at the senior center say, guess what? We got the shots. These 10 people, I know that they want the shot. Maybe we can look into them getting that immunization, getting that shot taken. So I've just had a, you know, a great concern about that. And that also, um, I noticed as well, and I just happened to um, be there and we're at the neighborhood that the health center trying to figure out how other counties were there not you, not our people. It was other people from other counties. I witnessed this, and I also have, you know, someone that mentioned it to me as well. And I'm like, wait a minute, all these people come here. What about our people that are here locally? So I just have concern that our community, our town, our our our, our seniors, our people that are high risk, that they're being taken care of, that this information is getting out to them. Besides, everybody don't read tap into. Some people read that, some people don't. They don't read that. So we just got to try to figure out a way to get this to the people because I know that the president has a certain amount of people he want to get to get um, vaccinated, but I'm concerned about the local level right now besides the, uh, you know, the state level. So I just wanted to make sure that I bring that, you know, to you all's attention. So if there's, you know, any um, suggestions that you might have or people or information that I can pass along, or if there's something that I miss, I mean, if there's something I miss, I have no problem of you all saying, you know what, this was here and this was there, and this is how we're doing it, you know, but I just want to make sure, because the next person that come along, I want to make sure that they get this information and I don't want people to miss out on it because I know that people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And if I got the knowledge, I'm going to pass it on, especially in this time right now that we're dealing with. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Ms. Briggs Jones. Uh, there's a caller, uh, last three digits uh, ending 521. Yes. Hello, it's uh, Marie and Sari, Watchung Avenue. And um, I'd like to say first, I'm really pleased that so many uh, residents are participating. I think it's going to be a good step in the direction of making for more transparency in this administration. Um, I, for one, am very upset and affected by the combined agenda slash meeting. It does not give us an opportunity to know what's coming up or to prepare. And an example tonight was that a totally new agenda item was thrown on and actually accepted. Um, that, that is just unacceptable. Residents need an opportunity to know what's coming up. And I think COVID has been used in some cases as a reason not to continue to do good jobs. There's ways around it. Um, regarding my main problem, which occurred when this administration reversed their agreement of September 2019 to find humane, non-lethal, effective ways to deal with conflict with uh, deer and wildlife. I, we had no opportunity to know that this administration had already negotiated with the county. And we are now in day 47 of killing in Cedarbrook, Greenbrook, and Cushing. We have three days left. That's 
absolutely unacceptable. It cannot happen in the future. That was pushed through. I still don't know who benefited by the total reversal other than the hunters, but certainly someone did because there was no reason for it. It's not going to solve the problems that you hear of, and you know that, but we've stopped giving you data because obviously the data doesn't mean a darn thing. But somewhere there's a reason, somewhere someone is benefiting. And now that you've got the county involved in doing this, you're each tossing the hot potato back and forth, saying, well, it's not me, it's the county. When county says, uh -uh, they invited us in. So... A couple of things. We need a way for the agenda to be put out in advance as it used to be. And I assume at least some of the council members know what's going on ahead of time because they seem ready to vote uh, regardless. So those council members should be sharing that information with the residents in their districts. Um, That's all I'm going to say for now. It's been a very, very difficult winter for people who wanted to enjoy the shrinking open space that we have in Plainfield, knowing that bow hunters were in there and not knowing where because no one will share that information or when because no one will share that information. And in two cases, there was suspect activity right at the playgrounds in the parks. That's all I'll say for now. Thank you and thanks to Uh, The residents who attended, uh, I agree with a lot of what you said. Thank you, Ms. Ansari. Uh, I see the name Lethel. Um, State your address for the record. Yeah, how you doing, Lethel? How you doing? Thou Blaine 420 uh, Lee Place. And uh, I just want to speak on resolution uh, 1121. Um, born and raised in Plainfield, and uh, I became a union construction worker uh, in 2014. So I've been a union construction worker for six years. Um, and with my observation and what goes on with construction and in these uh, smaller communities. I also was a union organizer, also am a union, a union organizer uh, for my uh, local union. And pretty much what happens in these local communities with construction is what's kind of happening here is almost the foundation of gentrification. You cannot have people working on construction sites for a, for a less than livable wage in the area where the construction is going on. And a lot of that goes on in a lot of these smaller urban towns where these developers come in and they don't pay workers a livable wage to where they will be able to live in a town where they're building. Um, Prevailing wage is also based on area standards um, for for whatever that trade is. And we should be really looking for area standards for our residents to do work. And I honestly does not do not feel like the um, bill will um, in any way inhibit developers or slow down developers from coming to the city because it's a statewide bill. So we'll be playing on a level playing field as all other urban cities that we compete with to attract developers. So by no way 
would that bill even slow up developers from coming to the city? Um, we should be looking for the best deal for our residents, just like developers are coming here looking for the best deal. Um, we're a city of employees and we have to find a way for the people that actually live here now um, to help push them forward and to help them have permanent income because these developers are coming in here and getting permanent income from the city of Plainfield for whatever length of time that building in it buildings there we need to find a way to make permanent employment and the only way to do that is through unions there's no other way to make permanent employment so um i don't see any way i don't see any way form or possible poss i don't see any way that we should support that bill i mean excuse me that we should go against that bill because prevailing wage and then especially with the pilot programs and the tax abatements, it just it, it gives more leverage to the people of the city and the employees and the people that actually vote for us and vote for, excuse me, that vote for you guys, the members of council and and the people that put the directors into place that actually vote for us, we have to look out for them a lot more. So um also, I do want to add to um, the decriminalization of, of marijuana. Um, I am a convicted felon myself, and I have been convicted of the distribution of marijuana. Um, marijuana should be completely decriminalized. It is the same as any other uh, thing that is bought and sold, like alcohol and pharmaceuticals, and there should be they should be making every sort of way and lane and avenue for people to capitalize off of marijuana. Um, and that's it for the for this evening. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, sir. Okay, it says Remy. Yes. Please state your name and address for the record. Oh, Michelle Blackburn, 717 West 7th Street, Plainfield. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to complain about the corner of Spooner Avenue and West 7th Street. Uh, it's a high traffic area, especially with the children, you know, when they was in school anyway, um, crossing the streets. I was almost hit at that same corner. Um, I had to jump on the hood of a man's car to keep him from running me down. It's a very, very dangerous spot. And I've seen so many accidents there and it should be a four way stop or a signal there. There's two schools um, in different directions. So there's a lot of children crossing the streets. The school crossing guard can barely control the cars to get them to stop. So if you guys would you know, help out with putting a four way stop there or a signal, I'd really appreciate it. The other issue is um, with the Spooner Court uh, Homeowners Association trying to make this into a, pri a public uh, street. We've been struggling for years trying to make it happen and we really need to resolve this as soon as possible. I'm a senior, I'm retired. And when the snow gets high back here, um, I don't even think an ambulance could come in and get anybody. And we have children back here. We have a pregnant lady back here. It's, you know, a life or death situation. It's gotten to the point where we need something done right away. So if you can help out, I'd really appreciate it. The other issue I don't think you could really help me with is, like I said, my address was 717 West 7th Street, but that's my back door. So when they put the address on my house, they didn't put me as Spooner Avenue, they put me as West 7th. So when I have people come over parties or whatever, everybody's at the back door. So is that a postal issue? Or could y'all help me with that? I don't know. But that's those are my three three issues I wanted to, you know, present to you this evening. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Blackman. You're welcome. Bye.
Okay, there's a caller with the phone number ending in 030. Yes, Gloria Bintowski, 1117, Whittier Place. Can you hear welcome. me? Yes, welcome. Thank you. So I have uh, three things to discuss or to tell you. Um, the first thing is uh, decriminalizing marijuana. Great thing, great thing. The second thing also um, relates to criminal activity. Um, well, I couldn't say criminal, but the it surely does sound like Greenfield is a union buster. And the way that the uh, law was passed through a resolution, that, that was a crime. I mean, there really wasn't much. Well, of course, we got no heads up, the residents, but that, that was terrible. To, to be a resident of Plainfield, a union busting town, terrible. And I did agree with the previous caller uh, who was a union organizer. <clears throat> the third thing relates to also criminal activity, I feel, and that's the deer kill. And I feel that everybody who enabled the deer kill and voted for it in a just world should be charged and guilty of animal cruelty. And related to that topic uh, is the issue of resident safety during the deer kill, which was really not a consideration for Plainfield or Union County administrations. In Cedarbrook Park, there was well, one of, one of uh, our neighbors inquired about where the deer killing would be, and she was told by Ashley Davis, who got information from Rebecca Williams, <clears throat> the freeholder, where the deer kill would be. And the person asked about the site because she wanted to avoid being around there. Well, it turns out that that wasn't the site at all, but it, rather it was <clears throat> in a very different part of Cedarbrook Park. I did contact Rebecca, and I contacted Union County Joe Pollake, who was implementing the hunt, and was just told by Joe Pollake, well, it's legal and it's safe. And not really um, respecting that information or considering it to be accurate, I contacted Lisa Burgess, our director of safety, public safety. And also what I had mentioned is um, there's inadequate signage at Cedarbrook Park. And there's fact, in fact, in Cushing, there was just one sign. And that is a concern for resident oh. safety. So I wrote to Ms. Burgess, and she just wrote back, well, she, she you know, contacted Mr. Dabney and Mr. Pate, and I think she said she was satisfied with their responses. And then I asked her about Cushing Rose, and she, I really got no answer. So, and then I said, who is responsible for public safety? of residents in Plainfield, and I got no response. So I feel that no one is responsible for public safety uh, of residents in Plainfield. Sad to say, and that's a crime. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Good night. You have a good night as well. So you see a middle uh, an initial F. Yes, Francie Moore, nine seven five, Fernwood Avenue, in Plainfield. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, mm. I have three comments. One, I live my house is a corner house, so it runs the Watchung Ave, Leland Watchung Ave, and in Fernwood. So at night, the cars go so fast through here. I mean, it's ridiculous. In the morning, the cops are around, you know, they do what they do, but at nighttime, someone really needs to be on the street monitoring how fast some of these cars go. They fly through here on Watch on F. Um, second comment is regarding the deer kill. I'm not in agreement with it. I was 
unhappy because one of the reasons why I moved here was because, you know, we have nature here and all those things. So when I found out about it, I was very disappointed, even more disappointed that no communication was sent out. Our Latino community needs to be aware of where these killings are happening. I had to go into different websites to find the information. I had to translate everything. And then I had to post everything on different Latino forums in Plainfield. So they could be aware of where these killings were happening so that they wouldn't take some their children. Because of course they go to parks, they walk around and they had no idea, they had no clue. So it was just very, tacky from the, you know, from the city of Plainfield, not to consider everyone and just put it in the agenda, man. Just give people a chance to, you know, give their concerns or, you know, whatever. I mean, it's just, it's not right that you guys don't, are not clear about the things that are happening in a town sometimes. And it's really a shame. Also, the third thing is, um, COVID-19 vaccines. I'm sure that you guys are having trouble like everyone else. Uh, my parents are elderly. They both, you know, go into the high risk. Unfortunately, Union County has been doing poorly in, you know, getting enough vaccines out there. I had to, between myself and my siblings, we all had to go to Atlantic City just to give my two elderly parents those shots and the appointments. And it took literally 10 computers and there's one, two, three, like 10 cell phones between my siblings, my nieces and my nephews. So we can just get two appointments for my elderly parents and they live in Union County. So if there's anything that you guys can do for Plainfield residents, especially the elderly, um, it would be great. Um, snow removal, I don't know. They did, I wouldn't say poorly, but I think they can do better. Some of the plowing that would happen in some of these streets, especially on Fernwood, they only did <laughs> the middle of the road. So there wasn't a lot, there wasn't any cars parked in our street and there's only like one car that fits back and forth and even the side streets is even worse. So those are just my comments for tonight. I wish you all well, stay safe, be blessed and thank you. Thank you. Dr. Francis. Hi, good evening. Uh, Randa Francis Nicholas, uh, 710 Spooner Avenue here in Plainfield. Um, I just uh, wanted to piggyback on um, two of the residents that live here um, complaint uh, earlier. Um, I've lived here in Plainfield and within this development for a total of uh, 13 years. And when we first moved to this development, we were sold beautiful properties, um, le at least the valuing anything from three fifty to four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, paying at least ten thousand dollars a year in taxes. Cumulatively, in this development, we're paying over a hundred thousand dollars per year in city taxes, and we get absolutely nothing for our money. Um, the developers who duped us and were um, pretending to be uh, an HOA, they upped and left um, informally. Um, and we've been struggling since they left in 2012 to try to maintain the, this development with the city lights, the snowing, the roadway, we get bills after bills and it's becoming uh, a financial burden for us here. And we've reached out to many people um, we reached out to our city council member, we've reached out to the city attorney, and we get no response. Um, and I am appealing um, to city council to help us um, to get through this struggle. Um, it's either, you know, they're, they're going to say yes, or they're going to say no, but either way, say something so that we know, you know, what we're up against. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Siddiqui. Hi, good evening. I'm at 706 Spooner Avenue in the same cul-de-sac as Dr. Francis, Dr. Garnell, Ms. Blackburn, who were just previously on the call. Um, we absolutely pay taxes, almost 10,000 
if not more for each unit. And there are about 10 units in this um, cul-de-sac. Again, we do not get any services from the city. We're paying for our garbage. We pay for our water. I do not use the school system in Plainfields. Um, we're paying all these tax dollars and we're not seeing anything in return. Um, I, I actually in person attended the city council meeting last year in February and addressed this issue. And, you know, Dr. Garnell has been working with the, the, the attorneys with the city. She has hired an attorney on our behalf. You know, we have done everything that we could in our power to come to a resolution because this is becoming very stressful. Even when it snows, we have to pay out of our own pockets to have the snow removed, which should not be, which should be done by the city. We are getting no services from the city, yet we are, you know, paying the tax dollars. Um, my other concern is the communication. There should be more um, effort made to communicate with the residents because I have no idea where there are vaccination sites in the city of Plainfield, what dates they are for, even as far as testing goes, I am I don't I wouldn't even know where to go in Plainfield. The third concern I have is I will Miss Blackburn's concern was Seventh Street and Spooner with stop sign or a light. Um, there is a Maxim Middle School on Eighth Street at the corner of Spooner. While school was in session, they do not have a school guard at that West uh, on Eighth Street and Spooner Avenue. It's a four-way stop sign that they have now implemented. But when school is in session, nobody adheres to any of those um, stop signs. There has to be a, either a school guard or a light, um, a signal for the students to know whether they should walk or stop. Um, it's an accident waiting to happen. I drive there every day taking my daughter to school, and I know uh, how dangerous at, at times it has been trying to cross over 8th Street to come onto Spooner, uh, coming back from the school that she attends. So please, if someone can look into that, because uh, eventually schools will go back into session and they should at least have a school guard there. They do not even have one um, in the morning or in the afternoon. It, it's um, very dangerous. And that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. All right, uh, I think Remy already already spoke. I see one one more hand raised, but uh, she already participated, so that might be an error. <clears throat> um, okay, so I'm going to just give an opportunity for uh, directors to address some of the comments that uh, were brought up recently. Um, I know, uh, uh, Councillor, you, you had one that, that you were going to field. You can just um, address that question if you. Uh, sure, Council President, thank you. Um, I'm happy to address the Spooner Court issue. Um, and I'm happy to go through all the efforts made by the city to address this issue and where we stand at the moment. Um, you got some information from council, from the from the speakers tonight, uh, but some of it was incorrect, um, and I'll be happy to go through it, you know, detail by detail. Spooner Court is a private street. Uh, we were approached last year uh, by Council McRae on behalf of the residents of Spooner to see if the city could take over the street. Now they by one of the street dedication, so that is they wanted the city to purchase to assume the, the rights to that street, to own the street. In order to do that, we engaged in a review of who in fact owns the street. And this was not easy because what we found was that a homeowners association was the owner of that street. And then we had to dig a little further into this. And we found out that in the early 2000s, approximately 2003, a developer built the homes on Spooner Court and created a homeowners association. But thereafter, the organization lapsed for whatever reason. The developer lost interest and no dues were collected for a number of years. And the bills associated with the maintenance of that street, whether it be the street lights, 
um, were not paid. On top of that, we found that there was, uh, so I'm sorry. So at that point, we advised the homeowners to reinstate the homeowners association, which had been defunct for many years. They took that step of, of hiring an attorney to uh, reinstate the homeowners association. After that was done, we began to be engage the, uh, the attorney to decide whether or not it was possible for the city to take that street. What we subsequently found out after running a tax search was that there were sizable tax liens on that roadway as well. So now what the folks at Spooner Court were asking the city to do would be assume the PSE&G bills that had not been paid for some time. On top of that, forgive the tax lien that was associated on that street. In order, there, now there's one other wrinkle that has to, that, that comes into play here. The tax lien was sold at tax sale. So we would have to make that investor who purchased that tax sale, uh, purchased that, that, uh, that lien whole before we could, we could take the street. Being, and this is not the only private street in the city of Plainfield. If we do it for one, we would have to do it for all. So based on all of the steps that would have to be taken, we, the administration made the decision that we could not accept the street as is. In the event that the tax lien was satisfied and the, the, uh, the PSC&G bills were current, we said we would certainly revisit that. And this has all been communicated to council. And I'm sorry if individuals feel like they weren't in the loop, but when there's an attorney representing a group, we are obligated to deal with council only. If their attorney did not advise them of those conversations, that is something that is out of my control. But we did work diligently for a number of months to make sure, to see if this was a feasible possibility. And unfortunately, at the current state of the street, it was not. So I'm sorry to be long-winded, but that's that. I just want everyone to know all the facts associated with this. We really wanted to help these people, help these folks out. We were unable to do it at this time. Dave, can I ask you a question? Sure. The the tax liens were associated with PSE and G or with uh, PMUA. Uh, it, it had it, it. It couldn't be PSE and G. So I'm sorry, I don't have that information from you. It's it has to be it would have to be PMUA charges because because there's no separate tax for the road they all own to the middle of the road so their collective property taxes are paying that this this is a this is not a property tax lien this is a this mu yeah absolutely it would have to be a PMUA lien but yeah. in another way that that lien has now been sold I, I don't you know I it's unfortunate but that would have to be satisfied for I, I wouldn't be doing my job for the city if I was to come to council and recommend that you adopt, that you take this street in this current condition. Uh, as you have a fiduciary responsibility to the city as council members, I have an obligation to provide the best advice for the city. In this case, I could not bring this to council. No, no, no. I mean, I, I get that, but, but these people got, you know, kind of left high and dry, not knowing they needed to, you know, that developer should have created an HOA and handed it to them and then gone on his way. He, he, he did, did, but it went to funk. So I'm not blaming any of the homeowners. No, he, he did. The development fell apart. Yeah, he just wandered away and yeah. they forgot they needed to do that. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. I, I appreciate that, that insight. Um, there was also a question earlier about um, seniors being notified of, of, of possible tests. Um, can, can somebody address that? And, and I'm, I'm just realizing I didn't close pu public comment. Can I have a motion to close public comment? Well, since then, I've got two new or at least one new commenter. Yeah. Councilman, I just advise you we have six more minutes available for public comment. Okay, so that's probably enough for one one more uh, caller uh, in that event. So we'll take we'll take the next one. And I could not remember if Mary Burwinkle had spoke already during the session, but we have not in this one. She spoke. At the she, did. she spoke during the resolutions um, portion, so she could speak again. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry. I'm going to speak very, very quickly, but Terry Briggs is right. I mean, Plainfielders have not been notified about vaccines that have been available in Plainfield. I went, I, I, I went on the, the uh, state website and I went to Elizabeth Public Nursing. My husband went to Donald Payne Technical School in, <coughs> in Newark. 
I mean, but there's there are there are vaccines available in Plainfield that are only available if you go on to Adrian's, like apparently if you go on to Adrian's like letter, which like a lot of people have not done because some of it got to be a little tedious. So that's the end. I'm sorry. That's the end. I'm gonna stop. Okay, we're gonna address that. I'll have a few more minutes since that was a, a, a short, uh, so uh, Gloria can can speak. Four uh, minutes. Four minutes. Okay. Name and address for the record, Miss Gloria. I already spoke. It's Gloria Binkowski. I already spoke. Okay. Uh, Austin Bailey. I would like to um, just clarify. Um, Council President, the speaker has already had an opportunity to speak. Okay. All right. So we, we've. Council President? Yes, sir. Uh, would uh, Mr. The Director Brown would like to chime in on or comment about something that, uh, you know? That'll be good. Let me take a yeah. motion to uh, close public comment and then we'll go forward with that. Thank you. Moved. So moved. Second, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Public comment is now closed. Um, all right, uh, Director Director Brown or Abby, or whoever wants to take that one. Uh, In uh, regards to the uh, vaccines. Yep. Somebody's on mute. Are you on mute, uh, Director yes. Brown? I'll, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can. Mm -hmm. I'll, Thank I'll you. Talk about the pet licenses, since that was one of the areas that came up. Uh, First, uh, we have had a delay in manufacturing for the actual metal license. It didn't am impact just City of Plainfield, impacted some other municipalities. So that kind of contributed to the delay of getting the licenses out. What we've done and learned from this is that we have shifted that responsibility to another person to handle full time. So you should, those residents who have been concerned should, uh, if not, not been contacted, should be contacted relatively shortly about their pet licenses. Again, I do apologize for the inconvenience, but it was something that occurred beyond our control. Uh, vaccines has been a, a national crisis. Uh, there's no other way to say that. Uh, but having said that, uh, I do want to say that the, the county uh, has been a great partner to Plainfield. But I'll go back through the process because it will take me a couple of minutes. The way that logistically that these vaccinations roll out is from uh, the manufacturers to the state and from the state to the various counties. They're not reading down yet to municipalities. That's what municipalities like ourselves are currently fighting for because we need to be able to get those vaccinations into our communities because we know our communities. Uh, we have uh, through the county been able to set up a site at the Plainfield High School. We are actually the only municipality that's been successful in doing that. Uh, and, and we we are not satisfied with the amount of people that are serviced at by any means. Um, our goal is to have as many people vaccinated as possible, and particularly our seniors. Uh, and because of that, we've worked with our partners. Uh, the health center has been um, at front and center and getting out to our seniors, our senior buildings we've been working with. We've been working with some of the other senior related committees and uh, in Plainfield to get that information out so that they know how to register for the vaccination. Currently, there, there are three sites that people have to register for. And I'll talk about the county and what they're doing to fix some of the challenges. One, it's the state. Secondly, it's the county. And the county has also increased a, uh, instituted a call center for individuals who don't have internet access or, or particularly for seniors who, who can't make uh, go online. Cause I, I filled out the application for the, for the state and it was long and cumbersome. Uh, and so then there's also the federally qualified health center known as Plainfield Health Center. Uh, Plainfield Health Center for, I think it was Mrs. Mrs. Jones who questioned other people being there. The federal qualified health center services uh, other, other communities other than the city of Plainfield. Uh, and so you will see people who you don't think live in Plainfield but certainly are serviced by the health center, particularly since uh, it has um, it has rebranded uh, itself and is doing such a phenomenal job in dealing with community health. Uh, and so, one of the things that we do here in Plainfield is we're advocating to get to get uh, 
vaccinations in our communities, whether it's in a uh, drive-by. We have certainly churches who have contacted us uh, wanting to be a site in all wards, uh, so we don't live out any ward. Uh, from all languages, uh, because we know that some of our highest numbers are individuals in the Latino community. Uh, and certainly we, we are working day and night to make sure that happens. But however, as you know, nationally, we don't have the vaccinations. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll start to see more vaccinations and we'll see the rollout. But we don't have what we don't have. And, and it's unfortunate, and I think it's terrible. Uh, but right now, this is the state that we're in. And we're waiting for those additional um, vaccinations. I, I know that the president released additional numbers. Am I supposed to stop? Uh, uh, have released additional numbers and those numbers will filter down through the state and through the county. What we're doing again is advocating for Plainfield because Plainfield can take care of communities within Plainfield. We know where, where our people are and we know how to reach our people, whether it's through our emergency food providers, whether it's through our houses of worship, uh, whether it's through any of the, uh, even fraternal organizations, however we reach out, we have to reach out and we know how to do that. We simply don't have those vaccinations, but then no, no city has it. And I wish we could have a, I wish I could have a, a more positive response, but I do think that we will uh, turn a page in this book and we will start to get those vaccinations that our community needs. Director Brown, I feel that that was a very thorough explanation, and, and I, for one, appreciate that. Thank you. Director Brown, I, I appreciate that, that insight and the, the uh, background on that. But my question is, when the vaccinations do come in with the increased production, whether it be two weeks or three weeks, do we have a proposal for vaccinations in Plainfield, and how do people get signed up for it at that point? So, Councilman, I'm sorry, but... I didn't hear all of your questions. So you said you hope that vaccination inventory distribution would increase in the next couple of weeks, let's say it's three weeks. Where where will that be? And how will people get information about it? Right, so right now the high school is officially the site. Uh, so each municipality, I'm sorry, I do have to take a minute to say this. Each municipality is required by the Department of Health, New Jersey Department of Health, to identify an emergency site where it, during any pandemic or emergency situation. For us, it's the Plainfield High School because of the size, of course, and needless to say, the parking. However, um, we are identified, we have identified other, other sites within Plainfield that can serve as smaller spots for distribution. Um, and so we do note those, and some of them are in our houses of worship. Um, because they have the parking facility. As for communication, that's something we're going to be uh, working on to make sure that everybody knows this is uh, this this is uh, central. And if what I really want to say is, if if we are not reaching a section of the community, then we will have to find a better way to reach that community. Uh, may, and that is my commitment. May May I just make a suggestion that there's a thousand ways to communicate this out, and all thousand should be used. But the first thing that should be done is that the, the website, the city website, it should be a banner across the top. This should not be in the body of an email. This should not be buried anywhere. This, this should be, I mean, COVID is our number one crisis. It has been for, I mean, that's why we're all staring at each other on the screen. Um, you know, we're a year at, at it now, roughly. So, I mean, this should be banner across the top of the, the website. It's, it, it, it should, I mean, the rest of it, any information about, you know, any of our council member pretty faces should be buried so far down on that website to, to not make it even exist. The whole site should just be COVID vaccine, COVID vaccine, COVID testing. Yeah, I don't disagree, uh, except that, you know, we have a limited amount of vaccines. You know, I don't want to set the expectation that we can serve everybody that could possibly see the banner. But, well, but it, the banner would be an effective way to get the word out. Council right. President, yes. uh, Director Brown spoke to a hotline for the county, uh, for people who aren't tech savvy, if he can share that hotline with us, so then we can then begin to share it with our constituents, that would be helpful. I will get that out to you tomorrow, Councilwoman. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposition or abstentions, hearing and seeing none, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you all. Thank Good you. Night.